Okay, cool. So we are recording. Um, so yeah, that first test is going to be ECGs. And I think it seems like you guys got a pretty good introduction last semester. Um, my lecture is available if you want it as a kind of a backup or a review. Um, my phone number and Justin's phone number are in the chat. So me, text me anytime for anything. I know I'm repeating myself, but it's just recording right now. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I wanted to go over was um, there are so many tubes in ICU, you walk in the room and you're like, oh my God, like what I walk into, right? So I want to get you guys just a little bit more comfortable with like walking in the room and just knowing what stuff is. Understanding like connecting the patho and the medication, all that's really deep and that's going to be what AMS will prepare you for. But to where you're not freaked out on your first day of clinical and you feel a little bit more confident walking in, it's kind of my goal today. Um, so I'm going to share my PowerPoint. Um, I, I love feedback. I love conversations with you guys. So the more you want to jump in, like, go for it. I don't like talking at a, at a computer screen. Mm, present a tab. Okay. Can we all see the PowerPoint? That was my short last name before I married Justin. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> Sorry. When I was filling up paperwork, I was like, God, this sucks. Anyway, um, okay, so big thing today is just kind of like, what are all these tubes? How do I tell the difference between them? Um, I'm going to start basic so we can build up because when you walk into the room, there's so much on your patient. I can't stress this enough. Just look at your patient. If there's a, something on your patient or in your patient, it's there for a reason. You need to know why it's there. What purpose? So, for like a, a feeding tube, for example, like an NG tube, is it connected to suction? Is it if it's connected to suction, why? Like, why do we want the stomach empty? Is it clamped? Okay, cool. It's clamped. Does this patient need nutrition? Or if it's getting nutrition through the tube, what kind of nutrition are they getting? So, you should be questioning everything in that room. All right. So, I'm going to start very basic. You have your peripheral IVs, which is on the left side of your screen. Um, at, most patients are going to start with a peripheral IV. They walk into ER, even if it's an emergency. We're just going to get whatever access we can get. Um, for most hospitals, the policy is that it's good for three days, um, and obviously, like, your nurse can place it. I don't know if you guys, I feel like midlines are kind of catching popularity a little bit. The right side of your screen is a midline, so it's a little bit longer. It's three to eight inches long in comparison to a peripheral, and they're usually good for two weeks. Again, all of this is kind of around hospital policy, so you might hear a little bit different, but it shouldn't be vastly different from what I'm telling you. Um, so midline, the peripheral IVs, you know, we base the, um, the color or the gauge off the color of the catheter. The midlines tend to have kind of a purple. The only thing I can say is if, if you have some kind of what you think is IV access entering your patient, go look at that site because the midlines will usually say midline on them. A pick will say midline or a pick will say pick somewhere on there. Um, so if you're really not sure, just take a really good look at what it is. And if there's any writing anywhere, read it. So you have your midlines. Um, those can get placed by a nurse. They are ultrasound guided. So you just have to get trained on how to use the ultrasound because it is kind of a longer needle that tries to go into a little bit of a deeper vein. I don't want to take a ton of your time. So I'm going to go kind of fast. If there's anything you guys want me to stop, like by all means, uh, raise your hand or in, you know interject. Put it, in the chat. Put it in the chat. Justin's going to monitor the chat for me too. So center lines are your best friend in ICU. Um, you might see CVC standing for central venous catheter. So that's their formal name. We refer to them as a central line, or you might see TLC, which is a triple lumen catheter. Um, and I think as we go, those terms are going to make a little bit more sense. But the short version is that it is a catheter placed into a very large vein. They're very long and the end will usually stop right before the superior vena cava. So I have kind of my accesses out here where we, as the nurse would connect. Can you see my pointer? Mm, a little bit, yeah. A little bit, okay. That's not what I wanted. Sorry. I usually use Zoom, but I there's a new um, cap on how long I can do a Zoom. Anyway, so central lines will enter, and then they usually basically they're going to stop right before they enter the right atrium. So if they're going to stop right before they enter the right atrium, what's a complication you can have if that thing moves? Any guesses? If that thing moves, it can go into the right atrium and then start hitting the walls and causing all kinds of weird ectopy and stuff. So that's one fun fact. Um, a central line has to be placed by a physician or if you're an NP that has been trained, totally depends on where you work, um, but they'll train you how to place it. They're usually between six and 11 inches long. And then these are the three places, These and this is kind of key, the only three places you're gonna find a central line. 
It's either in the neck, which we call an internal jugular or IJ. So that you might see IJ TLC. That means interjugular triple lumen catheter, all right? The, when you read through the chart, that's where you start to learn all this stuff. So this particular patient on the picture, she's got an internal jugular catheter. It's in her IJ. It kind of got taped and sutured over here. And then I'm calling this a triple lumen because there's one, two, three ports to work with. For these three locations, you 99.99% of the time, you're going to have a, um, a triple lumen catheter. The next one is a chest or subclavian. So it looks just like this, but they're instead of putting it in the neck, they're going to put it right below the clavicle bone. And then the last one is the groin. So that would be a femoral central line. Um, what would be a drawback of putting it in that area in the femoral vein? Dirty. It's dirty. Yeah, it's dirty. Like, you know, a lot of people are overweight. So it's kind of like bunched up in all the fat and it's just not, not a great place, but you know, you'll see over time, like we're going to put it where we can put it. Most of your physicians are going to try IJ or subclavian first, and then we'll do femoral if we have to. These are typically on the right side of the body, just because that it's easier for the physician to place it. If, um, but it's not, it's possible for them to be on the left. So most of the time you're going to find these in for sure, these are three locations and on the right side of the body. Questions before I move on? We're good. Okay. A pick line, this is what confused me as a student. A pick line does fall under the umbrella or category of a central line. So um, with that being said, a pick line is technically a central line, but it's peripherally inserted, meaning it's inserted further out on the body, right? So in lingo and like just ICU nursing lingo, if we say, hey, the patient has a central line, we for sure mean one of these three locations. So IJ, subclavian, or femoral. If we say pick line, it is always in the upper arm. There's a few things in nursing where you can say always. Pick line is always in the upper arm, okay? So it's a peripherally inserted central catheter. This one can get placed by an RN. It can usually, again, usually on the right side of the body, but it can be right or left. This one's a little bit shorter. So it's six to nine and a half inches long versus this one is six to 11. Um, and again, you're only gonna find it up on, on the upper arms. The other thing that varies when I, there's a single lumen, double lumen, triple lumen. So if you guys are looking at this picture right on the right bottom right corner, how many lumens does that have? Anything chat? Okay. So this one's a double limbing me. I have two ports as a nurse that I can connect to. There's two ports, two holes in there. This one in comparison is a central line that's a triple lumen. So um your central lines in these three locations are, you know, always three ports or triple lumen. Your pick line is where it can get weird because your pick line can have a one, two, or three ports, meaning single, double, or triple lumen. Any questions? Where does the pick line terminate inside? I have a picture. Okay. <laughs> uh, so this, this is a quick picture. This top one up here would be your IJ. So it goes through your internal jugular and kind of terminates down above the right atrium. Your subclavian is right here. So it goes right under the clavicle, terminates above the right subclavian. And then your pick line is going to go into usually one of the bigger like basilic veins. And it's, it is pretty long. So th its goal is to terminate that far. My my argument with this picture is that if a pick line is a little bit shorter than a central line, it's not going to make it. It's not going to make it all the way to the right atrium. So the kind of the idea behind the pick line is that it does go very deep, very far, but I don't. It's never really going to terminate that far. Depends on your patient's anatomy. Does that picture help a little bit? Yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. Any other picture or any other questions? Sorry. Anytime a patient's getting a central line or a pick line, if you see somebody in the room with all these like blue, um, like kind of this picture shows here, they got a blue drape and they're all, that's all sterile material. Go watch whatever's happening. And then, you know, if you get a good nurse, good physician, they're going to explain all the steps as they go. Um, so this right here is the nurse in um, placing a pick line. Um, ports and huber needles, these aren't quite as common, but again, I want you to see, you know, know what it looks like when you see it. This is still kind of considered a central line, but it's surgically implanted under the skin. So this tends to be for people who are constantly in the hospital, all times for cancer patients, chemo patients, where they need good IV access that's kind of permanent, right? So this is going to get surgically implanted. You can see this disc right here. 
is the part that we as nurses will access. And then this tube right here runs up and this whole thing's gonna run right where a central line usually runs into that uh, superior vena cava and stopping right above the right atrium. Um, patients will usually tell you like, hey, I have a port, can you use that? So if we if they say port, this is what they mean. Um, this again could be on the left or right side of the body. And then there's a special needle that we have to use to access it. So the bottom right corner is it called a Huber needle. And you take this needle and you and you just poke in the middle of that drum and pray. <laughs> um, it's actually, it's not very hard. It's scary the first time you do it, but it's, it's within your scope as a nurse for sure. You need um, permission, like you need to ask the doctor, hey, can I access this port? Um, so you have to have an order before you access it because that's a main line to their heart. If you have a central line, a pick line, or a port like this, that drops right into their heart. So if you don't treat this right, you can get your patient very sick. Um, some patients are taught, hey, this is strictly for chemo. My oncologist says nobody touches it but his team. So no, you can't use this. You need to go start an IV somewhere else. And that's totally fine. The patients are, you know, they can tell us that. So whenever they have a port, we have a short conversation. Would you like us to use this? Or I can try to look for a vein somewhere else. And we'll kind of go from there. So any questions on ports? Okay. So this part requires participation. <laughs> um, if you had a document, this top left picture, what kind of IV, based on what we've talked about, what kind of access is it and where is it on your patient? It's a pick line. It's a pick line? How many ports or how many lumens? It can have one to three lumens, it but have it's one probably three. like two. Yeah, the picture looks like it has two. So it's a double lumen pick. And is it left or right arm? Based on that, looks like a left arm. Perfect. Yeah. So it's a double lumen pick, left upper arm. Pick lines, just so you know, this picture I got, this is basically what your pick line looks like. And right here down the middle of all that purple, it says pick. So I'm telling you, just go read it, okay? <laughs> um, so great job on that. The one in the middle, what kind of uh, access is this? Subclavian. It's subclavian. So it's, it's definitely not IJ. It's not in the patient's neck. It's under the clavicle. So it's subclavian, and then how many lumen do I have? Triple. Cool. So this is where you might see TLC, triple lumen catheter. And is it left or right side of the patient? The right. Perfect. All right. And then my picture on the top right? A groin. No. Um, no. Top right, not bottom left. Oh. <laughs> IJ. It's an IJ internal jugular, left or right side of the patient? Left. Looks like left. And then it's a little jumbled, but can you tell how many ports are there, how many lumen you have? Triple. Triple lumen. So I have a triple lumen, central line, and that's um, a left IJ on that patient. And then somebody already caught this one. This picture is kind of funky, but it's all I could get. So the bottom left picture, <laughs> what's that one? That's the groin one. Yeah, this is a belly and a leg if you're not sure what you're looking at. <laughs> and then, yeah, that's left or right groin? Left. It's left. So this is during placement. And then how many ports do I have or how many lumen? Three. Three lumen. So triple lumen, left femoral central line. And then bottom right picture? Is that a port? It is a port. So it is under the clavicle, which you might think, hey, subclavian, but it almost has like, have you guys seen a butterfly needle where it's got the butterfly wings to it? That Huber needle, if we go back, that Huber needle always has those wings. It's some kind of colored wing. So if you look at her, you can actually see those colored wings. And then there's one port coming off that thing. Um, and you don't really see kind of tubes or anything. It's just this one thing coming out of it. So that's um, a right port. Or they might say like porticath. So is this helpful so far? A lot of it is just like, it, it, seriously, guys, like, don't be afraid to investigate if you have some downtime, if you're, you know, I know you guys kind of roll with the nurse for a little while, but just go look at your patient, go follow your lines. Be like, where does this go? Why is this here? Um, but you guys did great so far, right? You don't even, you even know these an hour ago, right? <laughs> Other things you might see um, because it lands in the same place, so it can get confusing. This is specifically for hemodialysis. So why do you think this looks a little different than the other stuff we've looked at? It's filtering the blood. 
yeah it's but if you're looking at it and you're like hey this kind of looks like it could be to me this looks like this could be a right subclavian central line because that's the same spot i would see a right subclavian central line a couple things that are going to tip you off that it's dialysis and not something we're supposed to touch is do you see how thick that tube is it's like garden hose hold on i gotta admit somebody okay so that tube if you look at comparison gotta go back that tube do you see this tube in her neck right here that's a central line your dialysis access is way thicker because we're doing a lot more for it so a couple tips are it's a lot thicker you only have two ports i've never seen a subclavian central line with three so this that's kind of telling me hey this is dialysis and not a central line your central line um, is really thick it's only and always two ports there are always labeled red and blue and the other thing that's not in this picture is a lot of times they're wrapped up with gauze and tape so all these both ports are kind of tied up and taped together so has anybody seen that before because dialysis is their lifeline it's how we clean their blood so if i come in as the new grad nurse just like oh i'm gonna push meds through this thing you can cause some serious problems that way so your hemodialysis access is usually very obvious when you do see it um but again if you're not sure go ask the nurse hey i i think this is a central line but what is this right so um fistulas just briefly this is the other dialysis access that you'll see and those are um kind of rerouted vessels so you'll have kind of the lumpy thing you'll hear the uh the brewy and all that good stuff so i don't want to get too far into dialysis but a quick sorry i know whiplash right so i have my peripheral iv is good for two days or three days usually i have my midline which is good usually for two weeks it's a little bit of a longer iv so it's going to give me more time i have my central lines which are known as like could be cvc for central venous catheter i might see as charted as tlc for triple lumen catheter you are only going to see this thing in the ij internal jugular subclavian or femoral they are I've never seen it not be a triple lumen. So you got three ports you can work with. A pick line falls under the umbrella of central line, but it is perfectly inserted. So these are always in the upper arm and these can be one, two or three catheters. And then you have your ports, which are surgically implanted. So you're just gonna see that little bubble on the chest and that's gonna work just like a central line because everything, all those central lines are gonna stop pretty much right above the right atrium. Um, so those are all really, really good IV access for us, right? How long can Ooh, good question. How long can a central line be placed? So I actually looked this up and there's studies on it. And so, you know, like IV is pretty much like three days. A midline is usually two weeks. Central line, as long as they are still necessary, they are not infected and they're working, they can be up in up to a year. Um, so I actually have a friend who has a, a pulmonary hypertension and she has to get continuous IV medication. So she's got a pump, kind of like an insulin pump, and she's a nurse. So she keeps that thing in pristine condition, make sure it's always flushed and working and not infected and stuff. And she's had that thing for over a year. So as long as it meets all that criteria, these things can be in for a very long time if they need to be. But that all, whether or not that gets infected or moved has a lot to do with how we treat it as nurses, right? Um, we went over our pictures and then these are, you know, where everything goes. This is what kind of access? Not a central line. I know, dialysis, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Um, Amy Fistula. All right. So, why do you need a central line, especially in ICU? What can we do with it that, that an IV doesn't necessarily do? Um, I would say it's a quicker access to things, whether if it's, you know, fluid or blood or something. You're absolutely, so it's, that thing stops right above the right atrium. So whatever you throw in it, it's going to get dumped right into the heart and go through the circulatory system, right? So that's, it's really good access. It's good for way longer. Like there's a bunch of benefits. So we're going to go through it. one long-term placement, like I talked about. So as long as that thing, weeks, months, years, whatever your patient needs, it can stay in it is a potential source of infection so you will see hospitals kind of pushing to get it pulled out as soon as we can kind of like a poly um but if it's if it's needed it can stay in a long time um we can give stuff really fast so we can give anything through it tpn total uh, parenteral nutrition can only go through a central line um and then 
vasopressors should only go through a central line. So you're going to, your whole world is going to be vasopressors in a week now. Okay. So vasopressors vasoconstrict, right? Well, if I have a 20 gauge on my hand and I run a vasoconstrictor through it, because I want all my vessels to constrict to increase my patient's blood pressure. If I give it to the hand, it's going to vasoconstrict all this vasculature before it even hits my heart. So it's not a good idea for that reason to put a um, a vasopressor through a center or through a peripheral IV, like an IV in the hand, right? The other thing is, let's say that infiltrates. So your peripheral IVs are like two inches long, and they go bad and infiltrate pretty regularly. Okay, what happens if you have a vasoconstricting medication leak out into your tissue? Does anybody have an idea what would happen? Extravation. Extravasation, yeah. So it's going basically, it's going to go out to the tissue. It's going to vasoconstrict all those capillaries, and patients will lose limbs because of this. They've lost their hands, their fingers, their toes, even long term vasopressor use because it vasoconstricts so far out in the periphery. They'll start to get black fingers, black toes. And then if that goes bad in a peripheral IV, because those are more likely to go bad, if that goes into the tissue, they can lose that extremity or it, it's a whole thing. So anytime a, vas a patient's on a vasopressor, you want that going through a central line because that is really accurate, secured um, IV access, okay? In the ER, because I, I have an e a background in ER and ICU. In ER, if all I have is a 22 in the thumb right now and my patient's going to die, yeah, I'm going to run a vasopressor through it. But am I going to go beg, borrow, and plead for a central line for my physician? Yeah. So we're going to try to get that moved over as soon as possible. So anyway, sorry. Um, so when it comes to your central line, you can give fluids. You can slam fluids if you need to. You can give any medication. You can give chemo through it. You can give blood through it. And obviously like nutrients like your TPN. And then the last thing, which we'll dabble in a little bit later, is central venous pressure. So with that central line in place, if I do an appropriate setup for it, I can actually measure the pressure in the right atrium, which we'll get into later. Um, you can also get blood draws. How often do we blood draw? Like, our, it's, you got to think about somebody that's really critical. If they're on a heparin drip, we're drawing blood at least every six hours. If they're, if we think they're having a STEMI, we're going to draw blood every three hours, depending on hospital policy. We constantly draw blood on these patients. So you can use one of those ports and actually draw blood from the central line instead of poking them 8,000 times. So these are extremely useful tools. Um, if you look at the top left, so you, these are your three ports. They're capped off, but these are your three ports. Um, I do want to encourage you guys to look at the ports. So do you see this little blue, kind of this burnt brown and the white? Do you see there's writing on it? When you're with your patient, go read that. Again, go read your IV. <laughs> um, the ports, this particular brand, the blue says max 5 mLs per second. The white says max 5 mLs per second. And the brown says max 10 mLs per second, okay? So that's how fast it can take fluid. So if I need to slam fluid through a patient, which port would you pick? The five, the five, or the 10? The 10, I can see Christy saying that, yeah. The, the, your bigger port, right? So your nurses, I, I can't stress this enough because nurses tell you stuff differently all the time, but textbook, okay? You can put anything through any port and you can draw labs from any port. Your nurse might have their individual reason based on how they have things set up that they will, oh, we can only give this through this port. We can only do this through that port. So they might say, hey, you can, um, we can only draw labs through the brown port. Well, that's your biggest port. So that's the best port to draw labs from because, you know, you're pulling blood through a bigger area. It's a good idea. Um, is that black and white? No, it's a gray area. So just, I, I can't tell you how many students are like, oh, I can only do this through that port. I'm like, nah, not with a central line. You can do what you want. Um, trust your nurse's judgment, of course, right? So my question to you is your patients in ICU are on a ton of, um, bunch of medications, right? Let's say I have three medications to give. Um, I, three medications to give and all of them are not IV compatible with one another. So I'm going to run one through the blue port, one through the brown and one through the white. Can I run them all at the same time? Why or why not? Christy said yes, Pua said no. <laughs> I would say yes because they each have their own, even though you can't see it, Yep. I, I believe that once they get into the blue part of, of 
the catheter there, they each have their own line. So they're actually going in separately. They're not mixing. Yes. Is that, exactly is that right. correct? So, okay. Yeah. So when we say something's not IV compatible, it means like, let's say if I took like bicarb and solumedrol, if I took those two and dumped them into the same vial, chemically, they're going to cause each other to crystallize or make one more effective or one less effective, or they have some kind of chemical reaction when they're mixed directly. Okay. That does not mean they can't be in my patient at the same time. I can give uh, bicarb and then I can give solumedrol and it can be in the vasculature at the same time. So that being said, the reason we love central lines is, do you see this blue port comes down through its own little dude? So let's say we've got a bicarb running through this little line right here. When it goes into this blue portion, I want you to look to the bottom right. They are all completely separate on the inside of that central line. So when we talk about single, double, triple lumen, this hole that passes through, kind of tunnels through your tubing, that's called a lumen. So if you have, let's say my blue, this is a medication, it's going to run through and it's going to run through this lumen all by itself. Okay. This middle one is my brown port and it's going to run into this big lumen here all by itself. And then this one on the right is my white port. It's going to run down here all by itself. So they never mix directly in the port itself and they never mix directly in the lumens inside my central line. And that makes you ever, sense. Yeah. I am. Um, Go ahead. I didn't realize that it was. Yep. And most people don't all, realize that because yeah. you feel like, hey, I'm merging all these guys together right. is what mm -hmm. it looks like, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we love central lines. Now, here's my question. In, uh, let's say this, this middle part right here that goes down into this whole big lumen, if I have two medications connected to that one port going through that one lumen, do those have to be compatible? Yes, those do because they're mixing yes. together. So that's a compatibility. These a huge consideration in ICU because it's, you know, you get orders and you're like, okay, where am I going to put this? Um, the good thing about the central line is you have three different options. Anything you build off, if I build medications off the blue port or the brown port or the white port, those all have to be IV compatible because they're all going to definitely mix together inside that lumen. And also when I say single lumen, double lumen, triple lumen, if you look at that bottom right picture, that's what I mean. That single lumen, if I have a single lumen pick, anything I run through that needs to be compatible because they're all going in the same hole. <laughs> if I have a double lumen pick, I can run non-compatible meds off those two different ports. So port and lumen are kind of um, interchangeable. So any questions off that concept? Uh, I have a question. So if you're, let's say you're running something through just like a single lumen there, um, you would have to flush each time right between meds because you yes. don't want it you know not going through properly or getting contaminated correct yes absolutely so yeah if i'm working off the one port it's just like an iv where it's like hey i was running rocephin i need to flush the rocephin out of that give my solumedrol flush my solumedrol out of that and then reconnect my my rocephin because you don't want those drugs mixing directly inside that lumen so you can treat it the same way in that sense any other questions? No. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. So is there any specific drug that's common, like IV fluid, like medication, um, that's not really compatible with like the, the flush that we usually use, which is like NS? No, actually, great question. So not with the flush. I've never met anything that's not compatible with the flush. <laughs> Um, okay. Your common, like I don't play well with others medication is typically bicarb if your patient um, so bicarb, if your patient's acidotic, we can give them bicarb. And a lot of times we do it in one big IV push. But in ICU, you're going to see these patients are so like just persistently acidotic that you need a bicarb infusion. And it's going to be a continuous infusion of usually 150 ml an hour. So it's a big one liter bag with three amps of bicarb in it usually. And it runs at 150 an hour. And that thing is compatible with like nothing. So when you when you get bicarb ordered, you're like, crap, because I just lost a port straight to straight to bicarb. <laughs> Um, so there's a couple like that in blood. There's a handful that don't play nice with others, but for the most part, you can usually find a way. And we're going to have an activity shortly that kind of lets you guys practice that. Um, so in addition to, I have these three ports that I can use and each port has to have its own compatible meds. Okay. So if I take my blue port and I need to connect three compatible meds to it, um, one of the ways that you're going to tools you're going to start to see in ICU. So if you look at the picture to the right, how do you run all that? Like what the hell, right? <laughs> That's fair. 
Um, you might hear of the thing on the, the kind of the adapter on the top left corner. I can take my blue port and connect this little three, three doodad thing. And we call it a chicken foot because it's got three little feet to it. Um, I can connect a chicken foot to it and I can connect three separate medications down to my blue port. Or if it gets real crazy, the thing below that is called a manifold and I can connect six to one port. Um, and then do you guys have a good understanding of like a Y site? So if you've ever had an IV come down to your patient and then instead of being like a piggyback up before the pump, it's a Y site down by your patient. That'd be, it's really hard to explain without showing you. Um, you don't, the tools I'm showing you, you don't need them because you can actually Y site things backwards, which hopefully you'll see that at some point. Um, but these are really great tools because when you're looking at a patient that is on all this, you, you want, to have those tools, right? Um, the picture I showed you, not to freak you guys out, that is an extreme example. But if you have a patient that's sick, you have to be able to figure out where to run everything. Um, and usually they get added kind of one at a time as your patient starts to tank. You're like, okay, let me, I gotta add this, I gotta add that. Um, and then you have your routine meds too. So does conceptually, does everything kind of click a little bit? You don't have to be an expert when you leave here, okay? I have a question. Yes. So if you were to, let's say, give blood, right? You know, if you go to the previous slide, there was like the triple lumen and you said one was like the 10 ml, you would give it onto that one or, yep. okay. Yeah, and that's that's kind of, that's where that, when you talk about nursing judgment, clinical judgment, that's where that comes in that. If I've got three ports and I'm running blood, like blood's kind of a thick thing. I want those cells not to like lice when they go through the tubing to my patient. Um, so if I had to pick a port, I'm going to pick my big one. So that's okay. where your nurses are like, oh, you can only give blood through this one. Technically, could you give it through the other ones? Yeah. But should you probably give it through the bigger one? Yeah. So that's, there's a ton of nursing judgment in setting this stuff up. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. I lost my PowerPoint there. Just, okay. The last thing is CVP monitoring. Um, this is a terrible picture. I've looked for a thousand pictures to get a better, like, just image of this. I don't know how to find a good picture of this, but anyway, when that central line is in place, because it stops right above the right atrium, you are getting an indirect right atrial pressure. So what you're going to learn in AMS is that there's a pressure in every chamber of your heart, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, pulmonary artery. They all start to matter when you hit ICU. Um, so I'm going to give you a very kind of vague understanding. When your patient is septic, they tend to vasodilate and they have what we call like leaky vessels. So all that, all that fluid that would usually be in your vasculature to maintain your blood pressure all starts to kind of seep out of the vessels. Okay. So if you think about the fluid volume returning to that patient's right atrium, are they going to have a high fluid volume or a low fluid volume? If they're vasodilated and all this stuff is leaking out of the vessels. I don't know. I think maybe low. It's going to be low. Your septic patients need, um, actually, I'll take out your phones. Go to your calculator real quick. Sepsis, you'll get into sepsis, but I kind of want to make this point real quick. This is how vasodilated and leaky your patients are. So put your weight in pounds into your calculator. You do not have to tell, tell anybody out loud. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure as hell won't. So, okay. So put your weight in pounds divided by 2.2 to get kilos. All right. And then multiply your kilos by 30. That's how much fluid we usually have to give up front fast to reverse sepsis um, vasodilation. So you're so vasodilated in legal, leaky vessels that patients that are especially in like late sepsis, septic shock, they need a crap ton of fluid. So that's how much in liters, like, you know, one, two, three liters, um, it's weight-based. So you give 30 mLs per kilo for sepsis. So when I talk about CVP monitoring, if I have a patient, this is the perfect example. So I have a patient who is vasodilated, they got leaky vessels because they're in septic shock. And let's give an example that they weigh 220, right? So if I have 220 pounds divided by 2.2, that's 100 kilos. And I'm gonna multiply that by, I don't know why I'm doing this on my calculator, by 30 mLs per kilo, my patient needs three liters as soon as possible to help kind of combat the sepsis, right? What if I throw in heart failure? What if that patient has heart failure? Can you give them three liters? Okay. But so what's going to kill them? The heart failure or the sepsis? 
I don't know, right? So this is where CVP comes in. It's amazing. Normal CVP, and it's going to wildly depend on what textbook you're looking at. Okay, so for the purpose of this slide, all right, we're going to say 8 to 12. You might see 6 to 10. Let's say it's 8 to 12. And I hook up CBP. My patient's really vasodilated and dry, and they got nothing com coming back to the right atrium. So my CBP is two. Can I safely give that patient fluid at this point, even though they have heart failure? I can. Do I want to hit 12, even though 12 is a normal? No, that's too much fluid. So I might talk to the doctor and go, hey, I hooked up CBP. He's getting, a, his measurement is two. So he's got a measurement of two in the right atrium. So he's definitely dry. I'm going to keep giving him these three liters. I'm going to go one liter at a time. What number do you want me to stop at? Let's stop at five just to be safe so we don't fluid overload him. So you're just going to keep giving fluids until you have a CVP of five, and then you're going to stop your fluids. So if that ended up being two liters instead of three, that's where we stop because we also have to consider that heart failure. So does, does the use of CVP monitoring make sense? The drawback of CVP monitoring is you lost that port to monitor it. Okay. The one rule about all those ports is CVP does have to be hooked up to your biggest port, which is usually the brown one. Um, and how to set that up and how to zero the line, we're going to get to, I, that's so hard to explain unless I'm at bedside with you guys. So any questions so far? So when we talk about hemodynamic monitoring, CVP is one of your hemodynamic monitoring tools. Did you say this was only used for patients with heart failure or? just the no, range we might actually it just kind of depends if it if it feels you know if you're worried about fluid status in your patient it's a good tool in especially in icu so they have to have a central line because it's good this gets measured by the central line um and not not everybody has to have it but it tends to be especially in your heart failure patients this is a great tool that's probably your your most used purpose i guess any questions yeah so can you just like an overview so how is this how is it actually measuring um like on. is it is it this you know so hold on to the question because i will explain that okay okay i'll explain like how cvp works but i just want you to know if i have a central line i can run everything under the sun through it i can draw labs from it and i can get cvp from it which we're definitely going to get back to you so, sorry, Pua. Any other questions? Okay. Um, okay. So, when you have a central line in place, what are your complications? It's a foreign object inside a body. Infection. Infection. It can get clotted if you don't keep this thing um, well flushed. Like, if you have ports, your patient's getting better, you have ports you're not using. Um, if you don't keep this thing well flushed, it can get clotted off too. And so a lot of times you will see um, nurses, have you guys heard like TKO or KVO? So TKO is to keep open or KVO is KVO or, or keep vein open. It's usually a really slow rate of normal saline at like five to mLs and five to 10 mLs an hour. Mm -hmm. And you'll see if a port's not being used, a lot of the time your nurse is gonna have something running through it just to keep that port good because you can lose an entire port if it gets too cluttered off. All right, so um, absolutely. Infection, you can have bleeding. If you have somebody who, is on Coumadin, and then we gotta go put a central line in, you might have a lot of bleeding in that area. Um, it can get blocked, like um, like I said, like a blood clot, it can get kinked, it can cause a pneumo. When they place it, they use a guide wire, and sometimes every great once in a while, that guide wire will cause a pneumo. You can be in the incorrect position, because they can't, a lot of times they're gonna use an ultrasound, but they can't necessarily see where it's going. So, um, it's usually stitched in place, but if it gets something happens, your patient can pull it out for sure. Um, I've seen that happen. They're just kind of confused and they start to wake up and grab and I've seen patients pull out a central line. Um, don't put it back, by the way. Um, it can also go too far. So if it's sitting right above my right atrium, like I mentioned earlier, if it goes too far, it can end up in the right atrium and cause cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, and it can go up to the brain instead of down on initial placement. So this one right here, your picture on the top left, what would your guess be as far as complications? Infection, probably. Keep going. That was a little more subtle. Just leaking. So this one right here on the top left is more, more bleeding because all this kind of black around it is bleeding from the site, 
which sometimes it gets messy when they place it. But to me, I couldn't find a better picture. I apologize. To me, this big kind of bubble around it, that's all bleeding into the nearby tissue. So this is kind of like, a, I'm worried about a hematoma in this area. Just overall like bleeding into the tissue. Bot the bottom center, which one's that? Infection. For sure, infection, right? And then yeah. the top right, it's hard to see, but anytime you place the central line, you have to have a chest x-ray before you use it because you can get blood return and everything looks fine and it's flushing. But if you look at this x-ray on the top right, this little line goes below the, the clavicle and up the neck, which is not where it's supposed to go. Um, so you always want that chest x-ray prior to using your central line when it first gets placed. Questions so far? Um, your job as the nurse is to stand there and look pretty and bring the doctor crap. <laughs> um, we bring the kit and we just kind of hand them stuff because they're, and it could be the doctor, NP, not, luckily it's kind of nice starting to see like, like NPs in there doing this, but, um, you're just going to sit. So you go get the kit, kind of hand them stuff because they're sterile. Um, you absolutely have to have a chest x-ray to confirm placement. Those ports, if I have that ports hanging out on my patient's chest wall, I have a subclavian central line. It's hanging out on their chest. They're drooling and spinning and coughing. And then I pick up that port and just connect them at and flush it. You're dumping bacteria straight into the right atrium. And I always, I not for a little bit for a shock factor to freak you out. This is how my mom died. They were not careful enough on placement and accessing her port. They didn't scrub. They didn't, we have caps now, which are great. There's caps that, um, Kira's caps are a little purple or, or sorry, orange or green caps that sit on it. They're filled with alcohol and they keep that port clean. And that's why, because you're going to learn about CLABSI, which is a central line associated bloodstream infection. So you guys heard about CAUTI 900 times in your life. CLABSI is your new word. Okay. So, um, CLABSI is because yeah. If anything happens, you have somebody who's already immunocompromised because they're in the ICU. And then you grab that port, you forgot to clean it, or you didn't use the caps, and you flush bacteria straight into that heart, that hits their system, they're going to go septic like that. Um, so really, really, truly, like, be careful when you're accessing these, these ports. Just scrub the hell out of them, okay? Um, as a nurse, you're allowed to take these out as long as you have a doctor's order. There's two sutures. You just cut the sutures, pull it out, call it a day. Hold pressure, right? <laughs> um dressing change did you guys learn that last semester sterile dressing change for central lines or yeah. central line dressing change no, i'm assuming i you would probably go through that in lab this semester i would think because central line central line dressing changes need to get done usually at least every week so every seven days um or as needed so if your patient's like bleeding and drooling on it and it's getting messed up oh especially if it's an ij and they're growing a beard the tape starts to not stick um so you can change it as frequently as you feel you need to if it looks bad but it's minimum every seven days to keep that central line clean. And it's a sterile procedure. That's a good one that for students to jump in on. So, okay. Questions on anything though so far? Because I have an activity for you. Okay, I'm gonna put a link in the chat. I'm also gonna screen share, so don't worry. I'm gonna put a link in the chat to a whiteboard that I built. So if you can follow the link and then I will also change it do you guys need a break are we alive we're good helpful okay oh wow hmm. you see how many people are there oh cool okay so i am sharing on the other screen or you're welcome to come on to the document that i shared too so it's kind of a tool I have for you guys. All righty. On the left-hand side, I have meds that we might need to give our patient. In the middle, I have my, my triple lumen central line, and I have two small ports and that one big port that can take 10 mLs per second. The other thing, I don't want to spend a ton of time introducing you to. Um, when your patient is intubated, they need to be on sedation. Just like we can put a number on pain and a lot of things, we need to put a number on how sedated they are. So most facilities, um, ooh, too far, hold on. All right. Most facilities are gonna have something called a RAS score. So it's Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale. You'll learn about it later, don't worry about it. We put a number on how knocked out that patient is because I don't want you awake and pulling your tube out, all right? Um, so 
when we talked about central lines and I could run all this stuff through it, one thing you need to consider is, is all this crap compatible? Okay, that's one. And then there's the concept of titrating. So has anybody heard of titrating? Ballpark idea what it is? Yeah, you're you're basically going to increase every so often mm -hmm. the amount of medication that you're giving. So the concept of titrating is, um, and you guys, I always start with oxygen. You put a patient on two liters of oxygen, you wait a couple minutes and their pulse ox is 85. I'm going to titrate my oxygen. I'm going to go up to, let me go to four liters. And then I recheck it and my pulse ox is 88. Okay, now I'm going to go to five or six liters and now it's 92. So you're making that decision. I'm taking feedback from my patient's pulse ox and vitals and I'm deciding to go up and down. So let's say I threw the patient on six liters. Now they're at 100%. You can also titrate down. I don't need them at 100. So let me come down to five liters and see how that goes. So that concept that you guys have learned about oxygen, you're going to apply that to medications in the ICU. That's what makes ICU quote unquote special. You know, we're dealing with critical patients, but there are many, many medications that you're given parameters by the physician, but you make the decision. You look at your patient, you look at your vitals, and you decide what dose they get and when you go up and down. Okay. So the activity here is one, it's going to be a compatibility activity as far as like, hey, what can I run where? The other thing is um, titrating medication. So we're just going to kind of jump in and go for it. Okay. So I have a patient that came in septic and you can get your calculators out. My patient weighs 176 pounds. So how many kilos is that? 80. Okay, that's 80 kilos. And then because it's sepsis, it's usually 30 mLs of normal saline per kilo. So how much fluid does a septic patient need? So kilos times 30. 2,400 milliliters. 2,400. So my patient look, came in and I'm like, oh man, you don't look good. I think it's sepsis caused from pneumonia is my guess. So we're going to start just giving you fluids. No history of, uh, of heart failure, right? So um, they already have a central line in place because this is make-believe land. <laughs> okay. What, what port do you want to run that? You're going to run, let's say one liter per hour is how fast we're giving it. So you want to start that first liter of 2,400. Where do you want, what port do you want to put that in? Probably the middle. You can give it through the big port because you're giving a lot of fluids, right? Does it actually matter which port you put it in? No. Nope. So, because I can't see the chat or the who's talking right now. So we put saline on my big port and I'm running at one liter per hour. All right. Um, because my patient's septic, they definitely need a broad spectrum antibiotic. So let's go ahead and run my antibiotic. So I'm going to run Rosefin. So where do you want to run that? Just in one of the blue ones. Okay. So we'll run it to the blue one. Could I run it with the normal saline, technically? Probably. How would I find out? Check your Nursing Central app. Yes, God, guys, I love that app. That was the best part of working at Concordia. I love that app. I sold it to everybody at APU. Um, if you look below, I've made a fake, okay, this is not accurate, a fake um, compatibility chart, okay? So if I come down here and I'm like, okay, I need to run normal saline. Normal saline's right here and right here. So normal saline, and I want to run it with Rosefin. That Y means, yeah, I'm compatible. So you could put, you're free to put the Rosefin on the open ports, or you can throw it in with the fluids too if you wanted to. So we're going to go with the original. She said the blue port, so we're going to run Rosefin over here. All right. Um, so now my patient... We're going to get to intubation later, but my patient got intubated. They need to get kept asleep because they're intubated. So my patient needs to go on propofol. All right. So that's this top one here. It's a sedative. What can propofol, what ports can it go to? And if you're not sure, keep checking that compatibility chart. So I got propofol. Go in the middle. For sure. Middle. Okay. So it can go with my normal saline. Um, leave can it go with Rosefin? No. No. And your sedation, your sedation, your vasopressor usually stays on for a long time. So my Rosefin is going to be done in 30 minutes. It wouldn't make sense to run my Rosefin and then connect my propofol with it. 
and they're not compatible, right? So do you want propofol, assuming it's going to be on for a long time, do you want it to run with the normal saline, the rocephin, or by itself? Maybe by itself. Probably, yeah. I'd say by itself, maybe saline, and obviously not rocephin, because if you look at our chart, we're not compatible. Um, so propofol, this is a titratable medication, okay? So a RAS goal is how knocked out your patient's supposed to be. So if you can see that purple table on the right top right corner, I'm going to say that my patient is currently at a negative one. So I just intubated them, but they are, they're not fully alert, but they're kind of awake. Like they keep holding sustained eye contact for more than 10 seconds. They're kind of moving their arms. They're squirmy. They're coughing because the tube's in their throat. So I'm going to start, I know you guys don't know ranges yet. Okay. So don't worry about that. My goal is to get that patient to a negative three. So what does a negative three look like in compared to a negative one? Should I have sustained eye contact? No. No. Okay. So negative one is how my patient looks right now. They're not fully alert, but they're holding eye contact with me. They're looking at me like, what'd you just do? All right. My goal is to get them moderately sedated to where they can move their arms and stuff a little bit, but you shouldn't be staring at me. All right. So that lets me know, hey, I need to turn my propofol on. So in this text or this case right now, I'm going to say my patient's currently at a negative one and I'm going to put my probe at five. And I, that may not mean a whole lot. You can worry about the, the specific numbers later. Okay. Um, then my pressure, my blood pressure drops. Okay. I'm going to knock at the door. Um, when your blood pressure dumps in critical care, any ER, you get these patients where their, their blood pressure dumps. Okay. The first thing you should always think is fluid first. Okay. Beyond that, vasopressors help. So they will vasoconstrict to increase your blood pressure. All right. So very common vasopressor is going to be levofen. So in this situation, I'm going to say your blood pressure is 50 over 32, which is a real thing. Okay. <laughs> My blood pressure is 50 over 32. So I go tell the doctor and he said, hey, you need to go start that patient on levofed. All right. So levofed's my vasopressor. Where can I run that? Big port. Which one? The big port with the normal saline. Okay. So my levofed is definitely compatible with my normal saline. Um, what else, did it, else is it compatible with? Is it compatible with propofol? No. No. It is compatible with rocephin. Um, so it's kind of kind of up to you guys. For you. And again, there's no wrong answer. There's a lot of variation between nurses, right? So we're going to go with whoever, whatever I heard first was my um, my levofed is going to my big port, okay? So my normal saline and my levofed are running into that same port together. Um, when we talk about titration, I have now started for this blood pressure of, sorry, 50 over 32. What the hell? Hold on. All right, guys. I'm going to start my levofed at two micrograms. All right. This will make more sense as we get in the repetition. All right. So one thing we're already learning about compatibility, and you will always have some kind of compatibility tool at the hospital to be like, okay, the doctor just over ordered levofed. I don't know where I'm supposed to put this. So as of right now, I have a patient with a blood pressure of 50 over 32 but we're giving levofed the vasopressor to try to help with that. My patient's oh, intubated and too awake, so I'm giving a little bit of propofol to help with that, right? So 15 minutes has gone by, and you are you need to reassess your patient. So the thing about titration is you're constantly going, hey, I'm going to bump this up or down, but did it work, okay? So you look at your patient, and your current blood pressure um, – I apologize, I missed this. I talked about our RAS goal right here. So my goal from the doctor is, hey, knock this patient out to a level of a negative three. Your vasopressor goal, so for any vasopressor, you wanna keep your systolic blood pressure above 90 or your mean arterial pressure above 60. More often than not, your nurses are gonna go with the MAP because the mean arterial pressure is kind of the average pressure in the vasculature. 
as soon as it drops below 60, your patient is not getting perfused all the way to the fingertips and toes. So you can have a systolic of 90, but your MAP is below 60. So the overall, you just want to make sure your patient has enough pressure in their system that everybody's getting an oxygen and blood. So are we good so far? Hanging in there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that I've reassessed my patient, um, and these are my, I know my overall goals are a RAS of negative three, and we're going to go with a MAP of 60. Um, my new blood pressure is 58 over 40 with a map of 50. All right. And my new RAS score, so I want to see how knocked out my patient is, is still a negative one because um, that didn't seem to help my patient. And that's totally fine, guys. Sometimes people need a ton of medication. All right. So your decision to titrate, you have Versed, which is a vasopressor. Sorry. You have levofen as a vasopressor and propofol as your sedation, right? What can you do with your propofol to fix that RAS score and knock your patient out some more? Increase the dose. You're going to go up on the dose. And again, those parameters, like how much can I go up by, how often can I go, that's all in your order. So I'm not going to get into that. Okay. So your RAS, I'm going to go my, I'm going to put my prop up and we're going to go to 10. And we're going to see how that goes. All right. So that's what I did. I, my new assessment is a RAS of a negative one. So I'm going to go up on my propofol. All right. For my new blood pressure of 58 over 40, is did that meet our goal of a MAP of 60? No. No. So what can I, I do? Increase, that? increase, huh? increase the level. Perfect. Three. So I'm going to put my, I'm going to fix this, sorry. <laughs> my Levo up to four. Okay. Does that make sense how it's like, okay, I'm going to do this. They don't, you know, we didn't meet the goal yet. Let's keep going. Um, so your patient needs more antibiotics because they're very, very septic. So we're going to give vancomycin. So what port can you run that through? What does the U mean? You good. Sorry, I left the key off here. Some medications, they they call it like undetermined, meaning like we're not sure if these guys can run together. There's not a clear yes or a clear no. We're not sure. So you would only run it through the middle then because that's the only one where. Yeah, so I have, um, I have propofol. So if I look at, uh, let me see if I think. So Vanco is compatible with normal saline, right? Which is great. But what else is going with your normal saline? A levo. My levofed. So is Vanco compatible with levofed? No. no. So that one might be out. Well, that one is out. Okay. Versed. What else are we on? Propofol. Undetermined. We're not sure. Some nurses will choose to run it and kind of see what happens. That's up to you with your license. Okay. Um, is Vanco compatible with Rosefin? We this is the perfect, up. it's not, right? No. So if I look at Vanco mm -hmm. and my Recepin, it's not compatible. So you, now you have to rearrange things. You're going to have a nurse come in and like, oh, we got to move this here and that. This is why we make those decisions. So can I put, let me try to see. The Recepin might be done though, maybe. Perfect. <laughs> I like it. She's absolutely right. Actually, the Recepin will probably be done at this point, right? Um. So. I'm going to say my Rosefin is done because that was only, it's only a 30 minute infusion. So you can put your, where are we hanging? Vinko. I'll put my Vinko here, right? What's your other option though? Start a new line. <laughs> you could start a new line, right? <laughs> Sorry. Or you can reroute things. So I could be like, hey, hypothetically, okay. Hey, my propofol can go with my Levo. So let me throw those guys together and then put this one. Like that's where your rearranging starts to happen, okay? Um, So we're going to come back. Now it's been 15 minutes or so. We're going to reassess our patient, okay? My new blood pressure is 66 over 50. 
Lord help me, sorry. So what do you want to do with your vasopressor? And, and I'm sorry, a map of what do you do? Do we meet our goal? Do I have a systolic 90 or a map of 60 yet? No. So what drug needs to go up or down? The levofed. The levofed is my vasopressor. So I'm going to keep going up with that and put that at six. Again, like those numbers, don't worry about those yet. All right. What else do we have to assess? Sedation. Sedation, right? So we're going to say my patient's still at a negative one. This guy will, and here's the deal. This guy's done meth and alcohol for 40 years. Is he going to be easy to knock out? Those patients are very, very hard to put down. Okay. So my RAS score is still at a negative one. I cannot get this guy to just go to sleep and calm down. Right. So through a series of magic that I don't want to deal with just for, you know, teaching magic. Right. I am now maxed. I went up to 50 on my propofol, which depending on hospital policy is the max dose of propofol. I gave this guy everything I've got. Okay. And we're going to see what happens. Um, now your patient, your ABG comes back. They're very acidotic. We need to give them a bicarb drip. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. Of course you do. Yeah, of course. Right. <laughs> I have to. This is real life though. Okay. So I have to run bicarb now. What are we, where are we running bicarb? We got to move things around. We got to move some stuff around. Is bicarb friendly? Can with you only run it through the middle? Okay. So my bicarb doesn't play well to anybody. So I already know, hey, this dude's got to run by himself. All right. So we're just going to, we're going to undo everything really quick and kind of figure out how you guys want to run this. So bicarb needs to go by itself for sure. Well, you want to throw it on it here, right? Um, I have, what a, is it? Propofol and normal saline. Normal saline, right? Thank you. Propofol, normal saline, and your Vanco is probably done, actually. And Levofed. Thank you. I was like, I thought I had one more. So how can we run this? So you started a peripheral IV. <laughs> You decide around your normal saline over there. <laughs> now what are we doing? Propofol, Levo. What do you guys want to run together? This is, and I, I swear to God, guys, this is how it goes. You're like, ah, oh, crap. We got an order and you sit down and you're like, where am I going to put this? The Banco can only go with the saline, right? Okay. Is that what I'm? Let me see. So I got Vanco is with normal uh, normal saline. Yes, Levo no, Propofol. It's un undetermined. So you're like, eh, do I want to take that risk? So let's run our, our antibiotic off our fluid into our hand, our little IV, my peripheral IV over here. That's a good decision. And then do Propofol and Levo play well together? No. That's right here. That's a no. Okay. So these can go, doesn't actually matter, right? Propofol and Levo. Perfect. All right. We mitigated that disaster. All right. Um, your new blood pressure, because it's been a while, is 77 over 55 with a map of 57. Are we doing better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're doing better. Is that your goal? Did you hit a systolic of 90 or a map of 60? Mm -hmm. Nope. What do you have to do? Keep increasing. Okay. So, Levo, we were at six. So, do you want to go to following our pattern so far? Um, eight. Yeah, eight, because we went two, four, six, eight, which is kind of how it goes, all right? And by teaching magic, okay, your last RAS score was still a negative one, and you maxed out on propofol, okay? What do you, any guesses what you need to do if you've hit that window already? I've given him all the propofol I could possibly give this guy, and he's still not out. What's my next decision? 
get orders for something stronger? Yes. Well, not stronger. So what you're going to learn is there are five vasopressors that a patient can be on. I can max. So vasopressors are vasoconstrictors, right? I have maxed them on Versed or sorry, on Levafed. This one's both. Yeah, I know. Oh. I'm going to explain both. Sorry. So I, on vasopressors itself, I can max you on a vasopressor. You're still taking. And then I add a vasopressor and you still take and I add a vasopressor. I can have, I've had a patient max on all five vasopressors at the highest dose I can give them. Okay. Beyond that, there is nothing we can do but pray. So um, in that case, you're going up and up and up. And before I max out on my vasopressor, I'm already calling the doctor going, hey, my levofed's almost maxed out. Can I add neosinephrine? And then those two are almost maxed out. Can I add epi? And those three are almost maxed out. Can I add dopamine? Right. So just so you know, in ICU, the reason these patients end up on all these drips is when one's not working or if they're on the max dose, we're going to add and add and add and add. There's no stronger. You just keep adding. Okay. For sedation, you have three sedatives. You have propofol, versed, and fentanyl. So if, if I got to the point with this guy where, hey, I'm almost maxed on my propofol, do I want to wait until I hit my top dose before calling the doctor, waiting for them to call back, getting the order, having pharmacy clear it? pulling it from the Pixis, spiking it, and starting it. Do you want to wait that long before you ask for your next sedative? No. Same goes for vasopressors. You don't want to wait that long till you ask for your next one. So if you're hitting close to your max dose on that medication, you already want to kind of like get ahead of it, right? So um, in this case, I maxed my propofol. He's still knocked out enough. So the doctor said, hey, go ahead and add Versed. All right. So where can we put Versed? <laughs> This is fun once you get comfortable with it, I promise. With the propofol. So Versed can mm -hmm. go with Levo and with propofol, okay? You're going to notice your nurses like to keep your sedation off of one port and your vasopressors off another because most your all of your pressors are compatible and all of your sedation is compatible with the caveat that technically propofol does come up as unknown on a couple. Um, but yeah, so what, do, sorry, what do we want to run it with? With the propofol. Versed, let's, yeah, let's keep our sedation together and run my propofol and my Versed together. All right. So for this RAS now, I'm currently at a negative one. My pro, I'm going to keep that propofol still maxed out. It's still at 50. And then I'm going to add my Versed at two and we're going to see what happens okay so does that that overall concept make sense in icu you are constantly watching your blood pressure your map your heart rate and your sedation constantly because we're going up and down up and down up and down i've had a patient on 12 drips where you're just all day okay um so as you get more comfortable with it it's not bad but if you're hey we're going up on the levofed we're going down on the neo we're going up on versed that kind of gives you guys a better idea is like um, great question for your nurses too, is say, why'd you decide to go up? Like it's, you know, his, he seems kind of asleep. Like, why'd you go up on the sedation? Oh, well, we're about to suction and turn him and he's going to get really pissed when we do that. So we're going to give him a little bit of sedation, do our care and then knock our sedation back down. So, um, we're going to go the other way. Just for example, you come back and your blood pressure is 155 over 78 for some friggin' reason, right? Uh, what would you do with your levofed at that point? I could go down. Drop it. So my levofed was at eight. So what do you want to go to? Seven. Sure. Let's try seven, right? And again, you're going to have very strict parameters. It's going to be in your MAR. It's going to say, start levofed at two micrograms per minute, reassess the blood pressure every 15 minutes and go up and down by two this is your max. This is your minimum. So when you read the order, which I want you to do when you're in clinical, it's it makes total sense. OK, but overall, when it comes to kind of the complexities of ICU, this is it. It is figuring out, hey, my patient's sicker. I got to I have to add this. I have to add this. I have to add this. Where is this going to go? And then you're also watching going up and down, mostly vasopressors and sedation. You do have vasodilators and paralytics that you'll come across, insulin drips, that kind of stuff. But your big kind of meat of ICU is going to be sedation and para or sorry, sedation and vasopressors. So. Are we okay ish on the concept?
Okay, cool. All righty. So that was it for that activity. I just kind of a hard activity or hard concept to explain. Do you guys need a quick break? Maybe a quick restroom break. Yeah, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. I'll meet you back here in a couple minutes. <laughs> Let's get pressures. So no rush. I'm back. Maybe everybody give me like a thumbs up if you can. Yeah, Sorry to Susie's boyfriend who has to listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boo, I know. Look at all the work we do in the ICU to save your lives. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I got my thumbs up. <laughs> All right, so we're going to keep trucking through. We we got through. That was a big, big concept. The um, the titration and kind of like IV compatibility. It's you learn it. You, that's one thing you definitely learn. If you're going to be, um, this is my PSA to everybody. If you want to work in ER, you are also an ICU nurse, a PEDS nurse, and a psych nurse. So you better get real comfortable with those, especially ICU. Um, that's where I kind of learned everything. I started in ER and then I started getting more and more critical patients. I became more experienced. So they were giving me the critical patients. Um, and then I loved it. So this is, yeah, if you're going to work, if you're like, oh, I want to work in ER for the crazy stuff, this is, this comes with it. So, um, let me see. Go back to my, there we go. I don't even know where I was going with that. Whatever. All right. Okay. So talked about hemodynamics, which, um, so far for hemodynamics, I know that I can get a right, um, right atrial pressure called a CVP or central venous pressure. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Just Christy said she had to log back in. Oh, okay. So I don't know if she needs to be admitted. No, she's here. Okay. Okay. Yay. She's back. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Okay. So, uh, again, we were talking about hemodynamics. One component of that is my right atrial pressure, which I measure through CVP, which is central venous pressure that is kind of a, an idea of fluid volume status so again if my patient's really like super dehydrated or they have septic shock and they're vasodilated and they have leaky vessels i don't have a lot of return back to that right atrium so i'm going to get a very low cvp number in contrary if you have a patient with a copd exacerbation sorry chf exacerbation so they're just fluid overloaded and they can't breathe and all that i'm going to have a ton of fluid coming back to the heart because they have a really, um, they're very fluid overloaded. So my CVP is going to be high. 
So that's one component of hemodynamic monitoring that we use. There's a particular setup, which I will get to, that connects to that central line that gives you that CVP number. The other type of, um, there's three, the other big hemodynamic monitoring that we do is through an arterial line, which is my best friend. Um, an arterial line is basically, it looks a lot like an IV and it goes into an artery. Okay, so it's just a catheter, goes into the artery. Um, it is, so all of our medications are intravenous, which means all those medications have been tested and whatever to go through the venous system. Medications can absolutely not go through an arterial line ever, okay? Um, so just arterial lines are, they're there for two reasons, all right? Um, common sites, really all you're ever gonna see is your radial artery, your brachial artery, and maybe femoral artery. So technically an A-line can get placed in kind of any artery, but those are the three that you're going to see. So what I want you guys to focus on on this slide is the left-hand side, he has a radial artery um, or a radial A-line, A-line, arterial line, art line. Those are words you're going to hear. And does anybody know why we have this brace there by any chance? You have an IV or a catheter in an artery. Okay, so one, you don't want to move that around too much because what happens if that starts to bleed or move or get displaced? You have a ton of pressure on the arterial system, so that's gonna be a whole problem. Um, your patients with the with the um, A line and the radial artery are gonna have this brace just to kind of hold it straight. So one is you really don't want a lot of movement in the area because yeah, it's one thing if like your IV becomes misplaced and it kind of infiltrates into the area. But if you have an arterial bleed into your tissue, it's a whole mess, right? So we just want to keep that stable and happy. The other thing is that you're going to measure a live blood pressure. So I have this magical setup to my central line to get my CVP. You can use that same magical setup, which I will explain to your arterial line and get a live blood pressure. Okay. So when I say live, I mean, if you're actually watching the monitor, you're going to see 133 over 60, 132 over 60, 132 over 58, 133 over 56, like second by second. There's like a little dude living in that artery giving you a live blood pressure number. It's amazing. Okay. So there's two reasons for an A-line is one, you can get that live blood pressure. So when I'm trying to titrate, if I'm deciding to go up and down on these vasopressors or vasodilators, and I, I'm trying to get a blood pressure for my patient, how awesome is it to have just a second by second blood pressure to see I bumped it up. This is what happened. I bumped it down. This is what happened. It gives you a live blood pressure at all times. Um, my example for, for an A-line is I had a patient who was probably like 500, 550 pounds that came in for respiratory distress. And when she came in, she had so much adipose tissues on her extremities. It was so hard to get a blood pressure off her. Um, so we intubate her, we gave her sedation and nine times out of 10, you intubate, you give sedation, the sedation tanks the blood pressure, and then you have to start a vasopressor. So she kind of followed every so often when we finally got a blood pressure on her, her blood pressure was going kind of trending down. And it was like every great once in a while. And we tried manual, we tried a thigh cuff, we tried everything under the sun. I could not get a blood pressure on this lady. So I told the doctor, like, I need an A-line. I need to know exactly where her blood pressure is at so I know where to put my vasopressors. Because if I go too high, I can give her a stroke. And if I go too low, she can code. So I got an A-line put in her. And what was happening in the meantime was whenever I did get a blood pressure, it was low. And then the next one was a little bit lower. And the next one was a little bit lower. And I didn't know if they were accurate. I was praying. But if my blood pressure is dropping, I'm going to decide to titrate and go up on my vasopressor to try to keep her blood pressure okay. We finally get the A-line in place and her blood pressure was like 200 systolic. Like, oh crap. So that's that's why you want an A-line because I, I was doing the best I could with what I had, but you that A-line was paramount for her because she's I'm never going to get a good blood pressure on her. So at least this A-line is in that artery telling me exactly where I'm at. So now I can adjust and keep her in a safe parameter. So does that concept makes sense as far as like why we would use an A-line? The other amazing thing is a lot of times your patients in IC are on a ventilator and we do at least daily ABGs on them to see where that gas exchange is at. And we can draw an ABG from the A-line without ever poking the patient. So if they have a central line, you can get all of your venous blood draws from that. And if they have an A-line, you can get all your ABGs from that. So if you have those two in place, you don't have to poke your patient except for like an AccuCheck. So questions? Okay, so that that a line blood pressure is considered another um, hemodynamic monitoring tool. Okay.
questions I can go on? I think you're good. Cool. I'm not on the side. I'm sorry, I was on the call. Um, how they're placed, I'll squeeze over this. Basically, you need to make sure if you guys have learned the Allen's test, do you learn that? Okay. You want to make sure you have, like, if I'm blocking the radial artery with an A-line, you want to make sure your ulnar artery is enough to supply blood to the hand. We'll do that. Complications, it's in our it's an artery, so it's higher pressure. So if it bleeds out into the tissues, if you look at that lower picture, if that gets misplaced and bleeds out into the tissues, you're going to have a massive bruise. Um, it can always get clotted, infected. You can cause nerve damage. There's a lot of nerves in the area because, again, they usually go radial for them. Um, so those are your complications. And then your job as a nurse is you're constantly, if I have a radial artery in place, or sorry, a radial A-line in place, you need to constantly assess that hand. Do I have, is my cap refill the same? Is it still warm? Is it pink? All that good stuff, right? Is that, you know, am I interrupting blood flow to this hand or are we still good? And that needs to be a constant assessment. The other thing, guys, since I'm getting a live blood pressure, I do want to show this real quick. The reason that brace was on that guy's hand is if he goes to bend his wrist, it's going to kink the catheter inside and I'm going to get a false blood pressure reading. And you need to make sure that blood pressure reading is accurate because you're going up and down on meds based on that number. So let's see. Um, so a couple of things with your A-line is obviously always assess the perfusion to the hand or the extremity, wherever it's at. Um, any big changes you want to tell your doctor. And then you're, you're still going to have a blood pressure cuff on your patient. It's kind of weird. Um, but you want to make sure that A-line and that blood pressure cuff should be relatively close together. So you're, I believe it's within 10 on systolic, or sorry, 20 on systolic. So if my blood pressure read 110, blood pressure cuff read 110, and my A-line's reading 120, those are close enough together. If my blood pressure cuff read 60, and my A-line read 120, those are way off. So one of them's wrong. I got to go troubleshoot what's going on. So it's always treat your patient, not your monitor. But um, when you do have an A-line, I just want you guys to know that you're still going to have a cuff on, and they should be relatively close together. The big thing from this slide is that what I have on the bottom, that 104 over 42 or that second example of 48 over 29, that's exactly what's going to look like on the monitor, okay? Pulmonary artery catheters, these are so rare. Um, I just want you to know what they are. <laughs> this thing is gnarly. So it goes in, it's going to go in through your superior vena cava. This tube is going to go into your right atrium. It's going to go into your right ventricle, and then it's going to turn and sit inside your pulmonary artery. So you're going to get a live pulmonary artery pressure from it. Um, I'm going to skim over this because this goes super deep. So I don't know how, I don't want to like overdo it with you guys. Um, but a pulmonary artery catheter, if I have the tube sitting in my pulmonary artery, I get to measure my pulmonary artery pressure. So if you have a patient with pulmonary hypertension, that's a good measurement to see how your pulmonary hy hypertension is doing. Okay. Um, I can't get into wedge pressure. There's pulmonary artery <laughs> pressure. It's su such a complicated thing. I'm going to leave wedge pressure alone. So when that swan gans is in place, it's called a swan gans or um, a pulmonary artery catheter. So you might hear it as swan. Sorry. Um, this is another hemodynamic monitoring tool. It's very common after open heart surgery. And somebody with like horrendous pulmonary hypertension. Those are like the two patients you'll ever see it on. Um, they take these out as soon as possible. They're a huge risk, okay? Because there's a balloon infl that inflates at the end of that. What happens if um, that balloon pops or like there's so many complications to this that it's it's a big thing. So short version is it goes, it's very invasive. It goes all the way through your heart, kind of right atrium, left atrium, pulmonary artery. You'll get a pulmonary artery pressure. And then you'll get a pulmonary artery wedge pressure, which I'm going to leave to your lecture instructor and or TikTok or YouTube because it's kind of complicated and I don't want to take that much time with you guys today because I know we're already going through a lot. Um, if you want to meet me after on the side, I can actually explain it to you, but we'll kind of leave it alone for now. Um, what that does is it gives a good idea of how your pulmonary artery, um, how your pulmonary vasculature is. So if you have somebody with pulmonary hypertension and it actually gives you an indirect reading of the left ventricle. So it can help or diagnose heart failure. Um, you can assess the function following a heart attack. It helps with shock, pulmonary edema. There's a lot of different kind of uses for it. So I'm going to ignore that. Um, and these things, they do look like this. So from this yellow portion here all the way out, 
you can't miss the swan hand. So it's usually in the right IJ is kind of where it looks like it's at. And it's always got yellow, always, always, always yellow. So swan gans slash pulmonary artery catheter is always yellow. Um, same thing. It's it's a tube inside your patient. So you're going to look for bleeding, infection. It's definitely through the heart. So it's going to, it, you might have some arrhythmias. So because that tube could be hitting the walls and causing things to fire that shouldn't. Um, so you have to keep an eye on it. And yeah, this is a whole specialty. So I just want you to know it exists. We'll leave it at that. Um, the balloon can rupture. You can sep or you could uh, pierce the septal wall if upon placement. There's all kinds of you can actually rupture your pulmonary artery itself with it. So that's why they are kind of moving away from using it because they don't know if the risk is worth the information that we get from it. So starting from here, I this I'm gonna go really into just just look at your room. Okay, go look at your monitor. If you look at a monitor on a patient that has kind of everything. This is what it's going to look like. So what are my top two green lines? I'm going to ask a lot of questions right now, by the way. <laughs> Whoever wants to participate. Oh, you're off the chat. Thank you. Cardiac. Your heart yeah, rate. the top two, three lines are my cardiac rhythm. Okay, so what is that? What is that 60 then to the right of it? The heart rate. Because it's also green. Heart rate? Your, your map. Map. That's my rate. Yeah. So that's my heart rate and it matches that my rhythm. So I know, Hey, these two lines are my cardiac rhythm. You know, um, we could do like a 12 lead EKG. So these monitors, a lot of them are capable to read all the way up to 10 or 12 leads if they need to. And I see you, um, if you guys looked at bedside monitors and other units, they might have one lead and I see you, they might look at more leads just to get a better idea of what's going on with the patient. So we can watch that rhythm in different leads. So my top two green lines plus that 60 in green, that's all my heart rhythm and my heart rate. What is the blue line before it that says play? Ooh, sorry. What the hell did I do? My bad. <laughs> blue line. There you go. Oh, two. Yeah, that's my pulse ox. Okay, so plus is like the waveform that gets created by my pulse ox. So what is this 98 in blue next to it? That's your saturation. That's my pulse. Yeah. So my, I, my patient's satting at 98%. What's the 60 in blue to the right of it? Mm. So your pulse ox will always pick up a heart rate. So here's, we always talk about like, look at your patient, not the monitor, or just try to troubleshoot like, hey, what's wrong with my monitor, right? So if my patient's sitting up talking to me and my two green, line, two green lines up there, my cardiac rhythm are flat, do I think my patient's in asystole and dead right now? No, what probably happened? The monitor came unhooked. Yeah, something came unplugged somewhere. I don't think you're dead, you're talking to me, right? So with your pulse ox, one way to troubleshoot your pulse ox is you should have, like, do you see how these blue waves, they look all the same, they're all nice and smooth. Um, that kind of gives me an idea, it's a good reading. My patients look, sitting up talking to me, they look okay, 98% makes sense for them. And then the other thing is that, does my pulse ox heart rate correlate with the heart rate on my EKG too? So my green 60, my blue 60, as long as those are relatively close together, it's not like 60 and 20, um, it lets you know which one to troubleshoot. So if my waveform, my pleth right here looks like crap, my patient looks like they're satting 40, my heart rate's 20, but I look at them and they're fine, it's probably my pulse ox that I need to go fix. That makes sense? Cool. All right. Um, so kind of a trick question, which on here is my blood pressure? both the red and the white? Ooh, good answer. Yes. I love it. Um, so yeah, the red and the white. So what's the difference between the two? Any guesses? That I don't know. Okay. No, that's cool. So my red in any, any, any time, I swear to God, guys, anytime you see red on your monitor, it's an arterial line. So I can walk in the room, not even look at the patient, but if I see that red line with a kind of a blood pressure next to it, my patient has an A line. So you're gonna, you need to pick up all, all the info you can from that room. So as of right now, I know my patient is on at least two leads in the green. 
they have the pole socks is 98% and I, they have an arterial line somewhere. I need to go find out where that's at. And that um, A line is reading 120 over 75. When we have an arterial line for blood pressure, we still have our blood pressure cuff. So that bottom right corner of 120 over 80 is your blood pressure cuff, your actual like one that we would usually put on the patient. Are those two numbers pretty close together? They are. So I, I'm trusting that number. My A-line and my blood pressure match up pretty close together. So I trust that. Um, so A-line is always, always, always red. Your CVP, your central venous pressure, is the next line down. And it's always some variation of blue. That's what kind of sucks because your pulse ox is always blue. Your CVP is also blue. Okay. Um, so my central venous pressure, I told you normal is between 8 and 12 based on what book you read. All right. So what's this patient's CVP? 9.5 9.5 perfect and then yellow it's funny i got this image and i've been using it and i didn't realize that yellow is not a swan gans but uh, i'd say 99 percent of the time if you ever see yellow on your screen that's the swan gans or the pulmonary artery catheter so if you walk in and i've basically got a blue two blues kind of a pulse ox and a cvp a red line and a yellow that's a very sick patient if you have all these colors up there <laughs> Um, so the yellow on the one you're actually looking at is the respiratory rate. That is typically in white. It's what's messed up is anybody can go in and change all the colors. I walked into ER one day and somebody made everything pink. And I was like, why would you do that? Um, but it does, it does help. I want you guys to kind of have that, that gut thing. So EKG is almost always green. Oxygen is blue. A-line is red. CVP is blue. And Swan Gans is yellow. Most of the time, unless somebody decided to mess with it. <laughs> and then the bottom left corner of that screen, what is it? looks like temp yeah it's the temp in uh fahrenheit or celsius celsius so how would the temperature be on that monitor <laughs> we usually have a rectal thermometer not sorry if we have somebody by the way people in icu cannot thermoregulate so temperature high or low is always a problem um so sometimes we'll have a, a rectal probe and it's just a very, like if you ever see a really thin wire, it's covered in wax. You just kind of put it up there and tape it to their butt cheek and that'll plug into your monitor and you'll get a continuous temperature from that. Yeah, also have mm -hmm. have temperature. yeah there are Foley's with temperature monitoring too. So any questions on this? We're almost done. Um, how do we get, so I have my CVP, my A-line blood pressure, and my pulmonary artery pressure. How do we get all that? It's through, it's through special tubing. So whether or not, it doesn't matter which one you're setting up, this is what you're going to do. And I don't know how far you guys are going to go into this in class, but you are going to grab, as the nurse, I'm going to grab um, just a bag of saline, okay? And then have you guys seen these pressure bags, this white bag to the left? Yeah. What I don't know if a lot of people have seen it, but what what that does is is the fluid slips inside that white cover, and then you pump up the white cover like a blood pressure cuff, so it just squeezes the hell out of that that saline. All right. So this is going to be a glazed over version. I'm going to grab a bag of saline. I'm going to grab the white bag that fits on top of my saline. Let's see if I have a different picture. Um. And I'm gonna put this fluid under pressure. This tubing is called pressure tubing. So if I fill the chamber, all my tubing primes, and then this right here is a transducer. So a transducer is, I want you to think of it this way. If I step onto my scale at home, I don't know what electronical magic has to happen inside my scale. Somehow I get a number, okay? Your transducer is what does that. It's the magical, it's a magical chip that turns whatever it's sensing from my arterial line or my CVP or my swan gans and turns it into a number for us. Okay. So when I set this up, I have my my white pressure bag on top of my saline. This tubing runs through here. And then this transducer, which is just kind of like an electronic chip, will sit in this white. I don't know if you see this white thing on top of the pole. And that just holds the transducer. So the transducer, again, is like just the electronic part of that tubing that turns what it's sensing into a number and a waveform for you to see it on the monitor, all right? 
Coming from this transducer is an actual plug, which plugs into your monitor. And then the rest of my tubing goes off to my patient. So if I want to set up CVP, I'm going to grab normal saline, this pressure tubing, and set this all up and connect it to my central line, and it will give me a central venous pressure. If I take that off my central line and decide to hook it up to my A-line, it will then give me an arterial pressure. And if I disconnect it from my A-line and connect it to my swan gans, it will give me a central vein, or sorry, give me a pulmonary artery pressure. So that tubing setup will work. It sets up the exact same and it will work for all three, okay? Some of your patients are so sick, they will need all three monitored at the same time. So you might have three pressure bags, three individual tubings going to each individual place. That makes sense? This is such a hard concept to explain. <laughs> you don't have to master it. You literally have to go set it up yourself and do it to really get it. So for being on the computer, does anybody have any questions? So the readings from all of that, all the pressure readings you're getting is what you're using to make decisions off of. Perfect. Yep. Because these patients are so sick, because we have all these, you know, left-sided heart failure versus right-sided versus I'm septic with heart failure. All those numbers just give us more information to go off of to make those decisions. Um, really, the nitty-gritty of setting this up and stuff is all, like, you don't have to know it. I don't know how much they're going to expect you to know it. Um, but I want you to kind of have an idea of what you're looking at. So if you walk into a room and you see that pressure bag, they probably have some kind of hemodynamic monitoring going on, whether or not you picked it up. Um, we also talk about zeroing the line. So um, let's say I put Pua on a hospital bed, right? If I weight it, it's going to give me her weight, right? But then I want to add McKenna, all right? And I don't want Pua and McKenna's weight. I just want McKenna's weight. What I'm going to do is with that hospital bed with Pua on it, I'm going to zero it. And then I'm going to add McKenna and that will give me McKenna's weight, right? So I had to zero the bed before I added McKenna. When we talk about zeroing the line, um, cause you're going to definitely hear about that concept, your transducer. So that's what these on the right hand side are. The red is my A line. The blue is my CVP. The yellow is my swan gans. These transducers, um, need to be at the flebostatic axis in order to basically zero, like, like you would zero a bed. So I wouldn't account for PUA. To zero the line, all of these transducers need to be at the flebostatic axis. And that, I guarantee you, that's something you're going to get tested on, at least that term. So your flebostatic axis is your fourth intercostal um, mid-axillary line. So it's right where this red dot is. So even with the fourth intercostal, and it's right kind of under the armpit, right? So what you will see in the hospital a lot of times is um, they will take this transducer and kind of put it on this clip on the pole, and we're just going to eyeball it. And kind of like if I raise the bed up, I need to raise my transducers up so they stay even with that flebostatic axis. That's what's going to give you an accurate reading. Beyond that, this is kind of, it's one of those things like you have to walk in there and see it and do it yourself to really get it. But if you think of, hey, I got to zero the bed with Pua on it before I can get McKenna's weight. If you think of that concept, the same principles apply here. That in order to get an accurate A-line reading CVP or Swan Gans, I do need to zero my line. There are probably a thousand videos out there of people doing it. So I think if you actually watch somebody do the zeroing, it's going to make more sense. But um, do you guys have any questions beyond that? I just want to touch on it. Okay. That one's a little rough. All right. So we're going to touch on intubation and then do assessment and then we're done. Um, Who is allowed to, in or sorry, what, what disease processes would require a patient to be intubated? I'll give you the easy one, COVID, right? <laughs> COVID can get bad and you can require intubation. What else? Not breathing? You okay, so a... not breathing is a good answer, but why would they stop breathing? You gotta think the pathology behind that. Maybe cardiac arrest? <laughs> Perfect, cardiac arrest. Okay. <laughs> uh, what about, so, I'll give you the short version, any respiratory problem. If it gets bad enough, somebody will need to be intubated. If it's COVID, COPD, you can live with COPD, no problem. And if you have a COPD exacerbation or what they call acute on chronic, so I have an acute flare up on top of a chronic condition, 
Um, if that COPD gets bad enough, they're going to need ventilatory. It doesn't mean they can't breathe. If somebody's on a ventilator, it doesn't mean that they just won't breathe at all if you took it away. They're not breathing effectively to maintain their pH and their CO2 and their all those ABG levels that need to stay in a happy place. They're not doing a good enough job because of the disease process. So COPD exacerbation, pneumonia, sepsis, COVID, like any respiratory condition, if it gets bad enough, can lead to intubation. What other system besides respiratory could lead to intubation? Cardiac arrest. <laughs> that was the one, right? Can you think of a heart problem that makes it really hard to breathe? Sorry, Justin said CHF. CHF is a big one. They get so fluid overloaded, they can't breathe and we have to intubate. So there, we'll intubate for cardiac reasons as well. Um, most of the time it's um, either like MI and they're unstable, uh, cardiac arrest or um, CHF exacerbation is another one. And then there's another really common system that we'll intubate for. Any guesses? What tells you to breathe? <laughs> Your brain? Your brain, perfect. <laughs> Dramatic brain injury, stroke, drug overdose, alcohol overdose. So you hear about, um, we might intubate for all those pathological reasons. Another one would just be airway protection. If you hear, hey, we intubated for airway protection. So if you've heard of these people, like they got super drunk, they were so out of it that they ended up vomiting in their sleep, but they aspirated it. Well, they were so, their CNS was so suppressed by the alcohol that they could not protect their own airway. They didn't wake enough up enough to kind of cough and get that out of their airway and try to breathe, right? So we intubate for airway protection. It's usually somebody who has a GCS or Glasgow Coma Scale of eight or less. So they'll say like less than eight intubate. It's because that patient, they're having a stroke or they're so neurologically impaired that if anything were to happen, if they happen to vomit or anything, there's such a high aspiration risk that we're gonna intubate for a day or two just to protect their airway. So you have respiratory, cardiac, and neuro are very, very common reason to intubate. Who is allowed to intubate? Who's with, within their scope? The respiratory therapist? Your RT scan, your physicians, um, your NP. So NP gets, if you wanna talk about that later, we can, but NP is very vague. You can get an FNP or your acute care nurse practitioner and if you're at a facility where you've been trained, signed off, they will let you intubate as a nurse practitioner. So NPs, PAs, physicians, RTs, paramedics, and then as a nurse, it's not typically in our scope, but if you do critical care transport or flight nursing, you need to be able to intubate. So there's actually a huge number of people that they, that are allowed to do it. Um, your patient is breathing like crap. We decide we need to intubate them. Even if they're really out of it, we'll usually give sedation right away just to kind of knock them out, make them feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, most commonly, I'll put it in the chat. Atomidate is in the chat. Um, that's a very common sedative that we'll give prior to intubation to kind of knock the patient out, even if they seem like they're out of it. And then we will follow that up with a paralytic. So put succinylcholine in there. I don't have time to try to spell that. Succinylcholine is a really common paralytic so um, that we'll give. So we give them sedation, let them put them to sleep a little bit, and then we give a paralytic. Um, both of them are IV push. They both last about 10 minutes. When you push that paralytic, that you have paralyzed that patient's diaphragm. You paralyze them completely, but including that patient's diaphragm, and they are no longer breathing. So you have to bag them. We go through the intubation process. Um, do you guys hear about the Rhonda Vaught case where she killed her patient? So Rhonda Vaught, she pulled Vecronium instead of Versed. Versed would have relaxed her patient. Vecronium paralyzes the patient. And we use Vecronium for this. Um, so that's, if you're curious, that's what happened with her. She pulled the wrong medication that started with a V. Um, so how do we intubate? We're going to sedate you, paralyze you. As the nurse, you're watching vital signs before and after to make sure they tolerate it okay. And then if you look at your screen here, this is an ET tube. So you'll see that abbreviated as ETT a lot of the times. This is what goes down the airway. The blue part on the right side is what connects to the ventilator. So the ventilator and tubing is all its own thing. And then they connect to this blue port, which is actually your, your endotracheal tube. Um, the markings on your tube are um, 
I gotta think about it outside of the picture. The very last number printed on the tube at the end is the size of the tube. So as the nurse, you are you are thousand percent responsible for knowing this, even as a nursing student. I'm gonna say, what size ET tube does your patient have? Most common for adults is 7.0, 7.5, 8.0, 8.5. So this one right here, if you can see on the picture, it's the very last number printed before that blue portion on the right-hand side. What size tube is this? Not sure. Am I looking at, are you looking at the 8.0? Yep, perfect. So that last number all the way to the right, that 8.0, or sorry, yeah, all the way to the right. Because the blue part is what's out of your patient, right? So that 8.0, I'm okay, this patient has an 8.0 ET tube. Justin could have told me a report my patient has an 8.0 ET tube. Good for him, I'm glad he knew that. This is under my license, I'm gonna go check it myself. So you better go check this too, okay? Um, so I see my patient has an 8.0 ET tube. These markings right here, did you guys have markings on your NG tubes? Where it was like, oh, I'm gonna measure it to like 50 or 55 and put it in that far. Exact same concept with your ET tube, but it's usually in the 20s for an adult. So if you look here, I have a dash and then a 28. A, this is actually 26 right here, 24, 22, 20, and 18. That's how far into your patient it is, all right? So you need to know your ET tube size. The other thing is its placement. So if I say um, the tube is 24 at the teeth, that means right where my patient's teeth are, that, that 24 mark is sitting right there. So that tube is 24 centimeters into my patient. You walk away for 20 minutes, you come back and you look at that ET tube and it's now at 22. So did your tube go in or out? Out. It came out. So it, when it was 24 at the teeth, it's 24 centimeters into the airway. I came back, it's 22 at the teeth. Now it's only 22 centimeters in the airway. So it came out too. Those minimal, just centimeter movements of that tube can be life or death for your patient. So that's why as a nurse, you absolutely need to know where that placement is when you come on shift. So I got a report, this patient has an 8.0, 22 or 24 at the teeth. I look at my tube, it's 8.0 and it's about 24 at the teeth. That part's not a perfect science, okay? Um, you might also hear at the lip. Sometimes that 24 lands right at the lip and it's easier to see than at the teeth. Do you know the problem between using teeth versus lips as an indicator as to where that tube's at? because your teeth don't move <laughs> yeah so good hospitals <laughs> well you, a lot of times just depends specifically like that's their standard we're going to go by the teeth because your teeth don't really move your lips can swell move all kinds of stuff right so just so you know as a student even in a report they are going to give you hey the et tube size he's got 8.0 22 at the lip 8.0 24 at the teeth all right the last thing on here I want you guys to be aware of is the reason, um, you know, like a Foley, you blow up the balloon that keeps the Foley in place. This balloon right here is what keeps the tube in place. So this tube goes into your patient's airway and then we blow up this balloon and it doesn't block the exit. It just kind of holds itself against the walls. The way we blow up that balloon is through this thing right here. Do you see the little blue pilot balloon out here? I don't have a pointer. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I have this little blue pilot balloon with this little blue thing right here. That's going to be hanging out of your patient's mouth. So as a student, I was like, what the hell is that thing? Right? So for RT, once that tube is in place, RT is going to connect a syringe of air and push it in there just like we would inflate a Foley. All right? If you touch this little blue thing, the pilot balloon, if it's puffy and squishy, that lets me know that the balloon inside my patient is inflated. If it's flat, that means the balloon inside my patient is deflated, which is a problem, right? So it's also an assessment tool. Any questions? Or was that a lot? <laughs> cool. All right. Um, ways we confirm placement, you're going to get a chest x-ray. Um, you're going to look for even chest rise and fall. It should have breath sounds on both sides. And then that sedation and paralytic that I gave my patient, um, that wears off in about 10 minutes. So what do you need to do to keep them asleep and comfortable after that?
Would you give them like Versed or something? Yeah. So it's you're going to go, you're going to change it to a continuous infusion of Versed or propofol or fentanyl. You're going to need it. So when you're grabbing all the crap for intubation, you want to go get that stuff too. Cause it's like, I only have 10 minutes before this starts to wear off. And, and what do you think the first thing a patient wants to do is when they start to wake up? They're going to pull that tube out. They're going to go right for it, whether or not they know what they're doing. So, um, after that whole intubation hoopla, you, that's where you're like, hey, am I going to be on Versed or Propofol? And then you're going to titrate like we had done during our activity. Um, vent settings, you're definitely going to go over this in class. But just real quick, this is also you're 100% responsible knowing this as a nurse. Um, and as a student, you should know this. I think it's you should be able to give this in report too. Um, your ventilator has, there are, you can manipulate everything with a ventilator, how much they breathe, how fast they breathe. You can ex like how fast they're exchanging gases. It's incredible what you can do with the ventilator. Your respiratory therapist will go to school just as long as we do as nurses. Okay. They usually do a two year prereq and a two year, um, program at a lot of places. There's always, you know, expedited ways to do that, but they have a ton of knowledge. Your RT is your best friend as a student bug the crap out of them. Ask them everything you can possibly ask because they understand these ventilators beyond what you will ever understand. So um, the first thing you need to know, and when you're going to give it and report pretty much in this order, is the mode. So how is this ventilator working for my patient? If the mode is AC, it stands for assist control. So my ventilator is doing all the work for my patient. If it is SIMV, the ventilator is there as a a safety net. So it's going to back off support and we're going to kind of see what my patient does on their own. And if my patient's not doing well, the vent's going to kick in and help. And then we have CPAP. So CPAP, um, short version is you're going to wake your patient up with a tube in their mouth. It's not fun. And you're going to help, you're going to let them breathe on their own for an hour. Um, so they're doing all the work with CPAP mode. There's a lot of other modes that are possible, but those are very, very common. So AC, SINV, and CPAP are a good place to start. Um, your rate, it depends on what the patient needs. So hypothetically, your patient has a really, really high CO2 and they are really acidotic. How do you get that CO2 out of the body using the rate? You want to give them more oxygen, right? So you're going to increase. So if you put more oxygen in, that doesn't force the CO2 out. Okay. The only way to get the CO2 out is to get them to exhale. So what you're going to do to remove CO2 is to actually increase their rate. So if I have somebody with a normal, pseudo normal CO2, their rate might be 12, 14, 16 on the ventilator. But if I have somebody with a CO2 that's like 60 and their pH is like 6.9, you can increase that rate to like 24. And the more frequently they're exhaling, they're blowing off CO2 quicker. So you can actually fix and manipulate your ABGs just by what we're doing with the ventilator. Um, your FiO2 is fraction of inspired oxygen. Do you guys, do you know what percentage of pure oxygen we breathe in the atmosphere? Like what I'm breathing right now. Isn't it like 20? Is it 21? Perfect. Yeah, 21. So we're all breathing 21% right now. So the ventilator is going to obviously offer more, more support. So you can, we breathe 21. The lowest you'll usually see a ventilator set to is 30. So 30 is good. Um, the highest is 100. Okay. So if you walk in the room and you see the FiO2 on your ventilator and it's at 100, is your patient coming off the vent today? No. Yeah. So if they're on a ventilator and they're using 100% FiO2 and we need, we breathe 21, that patient's not coming off the ventilator today. So again, that's kind of walking in your room and seeing your tools. Um, the PEEP, I can't stress this enough. Go look up PEEP. It's partial end expiratory pressure on YouTube. I, there are some cool videos that explain PEEP on YouTube. So the normal PEEP is five to eight. Um, that is basically how much pressure is left to keep your alveoli open at the end of expiration. And then your tidal volume, which is abbreviated VT, which is nice and confusing. Um, most adults um, take 450 to 650. So it's the milliliters of air that the vent is giving with each breath. So all together, what this is telling me, um, if you look at the picture right here, down towards kind of this bottom left, it says AC. So this patient's on assist control, meaning they're getting full ventilatory support. This 18 is my rate. So they're getting 18 breaths per minute. 
which each breath that the ventilator tries to give my patient, it's attempting to deliver 400 mLs with each breath. So as far as like the volume of oxygen to expand the lungs, right? Um, all the way to the right here where the 35 is, this patient's on 35% FiO2, which is okay. That's better than 100, right? So he's on 35. And then my PEEP is usually between 5 and 8. And my PEEP is 5 on here. Um, let me do, I'm going to do a quick stop real quick. I'm, what? 402? Oh, yeah, I know. Just give me a Sorry. Anyway. Um, do you guys have an extra, like, 10 minutes? I didn't want to run past four. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and it's recorded, so I'll send it out to you. So I didn't, I had no idea how long this was going to take. I just ballparked it. Um, so when I say, hey, what's going on with your patient? They're intubated. What's going on? Oh, my patient has an 8.0 ET tube. He was intubated on the 7th. It's 24 at the lip. My patient is on a uh, mode of AC, a rate of 18, a tidal volume of 400, an FiO2 of 35%, and a PEEP of 5. That's what you should expect to hear in a report. That's what you should be able to give in a report, even as a nursing student. And conceptually, these will make more sense as you get lecture and stuff like that. But I just can't want you to have a basic idea. The other thing that you're, you're in the rest of the event, like, don't even worry about it, okay? <laughs> um, there's a lot going on there. Just so you know what you're looking at, um, different vents are going to have different screens, unfortunately. So this one on the right-hand side of the screen, does anybody know what mode this patient is in? It's usually towards the bottom. No? Okay. I have an AC. So AC right here is assist control. So that's the mode. How many breaths per minute is this patient getting? Twenty-four. Perfect. Yeah, twenty-four. Sometimes it shows up as F for flow, but that's the rate. So they're getting twenty-four breaths a minute. VT, which stands for tidal volume, even though it's backwards. How many mLs per breath is this patient getting? What's their tidal volume? Five hundred. Five hundred. I'm going to skip way over here. What's my FiO two? What percentage of oxygen? Forty-five. Forty-five. And then my PEEP, my partial end expiratory, expiratory pressure is it's five. Beautiful. We look at the vent to the left. Um, and, and again, it's it's going to take time to kind of get an eye to where all this crap is, all right? The vent to the left, the top left corner is your mode. So what's my mode? Justin said AC. Okay. Bottom left corner, what's my rate? 20. 20. This is the one ventilator that sucks if you run into it, okay? My tidal volume is always reported out in milliliters okay so 400 500 whatever on this particular ventilator which is really common right now do you see how it says 0. 0.40 liters what would that translate to as milliliters 400 400 so your tidal volume is 400 this one particular vent with all these circles that's the one that that shows up as a liter and it's really annoying okay um, so your patient's not getting half a milliliter to expand their lungs. They're getting 400. So I have a rate of 20, a tidal volume of 400. What's my PEEP? 5. Yeah, five. And then my FiO2, my fraction of inspired oxygen? 21. It's 21. So overall, which patient do you think is doing better? The patient with a rate of 20 and a FiO2 of 21? or the patient with a rate of 24 and an FiO2 of 45? Who's more dependent on the ventilator? The, the, the 45 is more dependent. Yeah. So again, you usually don't see below 30. Um, but again, you walk in the room with some, if we have one patient at 100% and one at 35, someone's already doing better than the other. I don't know anything about them, but I know the one with the 100% FiO2 is not doing well. <laughs> okay. Um, these are different ventilators you might see. So the one all the way to the right is a very old version. So it depends on what hospital you go to. You might run into that one. Um, this one in the middle is the newest. And the one to the left is kind of like middle age. So they might look a little bit different. But somewhere on there, you should be able to find all those settings. Are these patients intubated? doesn't look like it. Okay, perfect. Now, 
what so i kind of bring this up because a lot of times in icu yes they're intubated but what happens here is the machines next to these patients kind of look like a vent the tubing looks a lot like vent tubing but do they have a tube down their mouth no no um so what what is this what kind of oxygen it's delivery do we have CPAP? Yep. CPAP? cpap or bipap um so this is still positive pressure if your patient's on this and they're they're kind of they don't look great they're sweaty they're working really hard then they might end up intubated um but i want you guys to be able to kind of differentiate between the ventilator and cpap because if you don't you know you need to know what you're looking for difference between cpap and bipap because i always get asked is CPAP is continuous air pressure um, during inhalation. So it's constantly giving that pressure to help um, kind of shove oxygen into the airway and open up the lungs. Um, and the patient kind of breathes out sort of against that pressure a little bit. The pressure might back off a little bit, but it doesn't, you know, they're fighting a little bit to get the air out. With BiPAP, it's bi-level, meaning that I have a high pressure to shove the oxygen in and then the pressure drops so my patient can easily exhale everything out. You ever want to know the difference, okay? Questions so far? So with the BiPAP, you would do the BiPAP for what kind of situation? <laughs> Honestly, um... like, <laughs> I'm trying to think. They're so similar. I'm like, yeah, I don't even really know why they would pick one over the other. Um, to me, BiPAP makes more sense. Yeah, that's what I was looking. I was like, well, but, why even have this um, CPAP? <laughs> I will. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. More, so BiPAP tends to be if you have somebody come in in respiratory distress and they're, you know, they just got here or they just started to go into respiratory distress. Um, if a nasal cannula face mask isn't working, we can bump this up to BiPAP, and it usually is BiPAP. Um, if the patient continues to tank and they get intubated, that's usually how that goes. The interesting part is coming off the ventilator um, with the tube still in place, everything's still in place. I will turn my sedation off and I will wake my patient up until they can, hey, can you hear me? The nod of their head, yeah, can you squeeze my hands? They can follow commands, they're looking okay. Um, and then we'll switch the ventilator with the tube in place to CPAP mode. And to get them off the ventilator, it's called a CPAP trial. So if you hear these words, CPAP trial, a weaning trial or like we're gonna trial the patient, um, they will take the ventilator and throw it into the exact same mode as CPAP like this and see how the patient does. Do you know why we would test that before we took the tube out? To see if they can breathe on their own? Yeah, because if I take that tube out and things don't go great, I know that at the least CPAP worked. I can go get the mask and throw them on CPAP. Um, and a lot of times we'll try that. We'll wean the patient, we'll throw them on CPAP, they don't do well, and then we'll put them back to sleep and continue with ventilation. So that's something I want to cover. But most of the time you actually, you do see CPAP more than BiPAP. So, um, but as far as why, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Any other questions? I don't did, totally didn't answer your question, Pua. I got it right now. We're gonna have to look it up. I know, I'm sure there's a reason, but it also is very doctor dependent. Okay, we're there, we're at the end. So you're gonna walk into the ICU room and you're gonna be like, oh my God, that's a lot of crap. But we just talked about all of this, right? So what equipment do you notice in this room? Looks like he's innovated. Perfect, okay. So we'll start with the basics. He's got a tube coming out of his mouth. <laughs> That's not an OG tube, all right? So he's intimated this tube comes out of his mouth. We have this blue and white tubing that's coming over to this machine. So what do you need to know about this equipment now that you're the nurse? So I need to know my ET tube size, so 7.5 or an 8.0. What else do I need to know with that? Where it's at. The lip Perfect. So, or the teeth? Yes. So how many centimeters at the teeth? So we'll say 7.5, 22 centimeters at the teeth. I'm going to follow this over and then I'm going to check my ventilator and then what settings am I checking for? FiO2. Okay. 
title volume. Perfect. Mm, the, 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 the title mode. volume. Mm -hmm. So FIO tune title volume. McKenna said mode. Oh, mode. McKenna said mode. Peep. Peep, my partial and expiratory pressure. And rate is your last one. So again, I love my fellow nurses. You can give me I need a report on anything in the whole wide world. I have this is my license. I'm gonna go check this. So I walked in the room. I'm like, okay, this patient's intubated. Let me go check. Yep, it's a 7.5. That's what she told me. 22 centimeters at the lip. Okay, cool. Let me go to my vent. I had a mode of AC, a rate of 22, a tidal volume of 450, a peep of seven, and an FIO2 of 45. Cool. That matches up what I got with what I got in report. So that helps, right? Um, what other, let's look at the top right where the monitor is. I know it's, and I know this is kind of hard to see. This is so hard to find these pictures, by the way. Do you see red on this monitor at all? No. No. So this patient probably doesn't have an A-line would be my guess, right? I have my two top green lines, which is cardiac. The blood pressure is yellow, which is really annoying because that's supposed to be Swan Gans. So I don't see like an A-line at least, right? um that's all i could personally take away from that monitor because i can't see <laughs> um what kind of surgery did he have ish mckenna said abdomen okay so mckenna said abdominal so he had abdominal surgery it's not it's because it's below the nipple line so it's definitely not like a chest open heart surgery so that's some kind of abdominal surgery what about his color yellow he looks jaundiced. So what problem might I have? Liver. I might have a liver problem. Yep. So what am, what labs am I, am I going to go check? Your liver panel, your AST, yep. ALT. And really, guys, you guys know this stuff. So AMS might seem overwhelming, but break it down. Let me follow this tube, see where it goes, and figure out what's happening, okay? If I have a ventilator, I want to check my ABG. I want to check my chest x-ray. I have um, abdominal surgery. Of course, we want to know, like, what happened with that. but um, I want to assess the abdomen. Is he having bowel movements? Is he having bowel sounds? If he's he on any kind of nutrition, he looks yellow. Let me go check his liver panel. Okay, does he have an NG or OG tube? That one's hard to see. That one's really hard to see. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all I can do. Uh, it kind of looks like an NG, but yeah, he's got a left near NG tube right here. Okay. When you see the NG tube, if it has centimeter markings, you should know where they're at. So like a left near NG tube at like 55 centimeters. Okay. They don't all have them. What else do you have to know about that NG tube? Is it in the right place? Okay. Right place. Good. If it's connected to suction. Perfect. You always, always, always follow your NG tube. Where is it going? Is it just clamped? Is it connected to suction? If it's connected to suction, what, what should you check? If there's any output. Perfect. Go check your suction canister. If there's a full canister of bright red blood, like, whoa, I got a problem, right? Versus like, no, nah, there's some gastric crap in there. So what's in my canister? And then also check your suction setting. I've had patients that are supposed to be on low intermittent suction and somebody left them on full vac, like full high flow suction. Okay. Because people, things happen. People get tired. Things happen. Nursing is crazy. Okay. So I'm going to make sure I see an NG tube. It's connected to suction. I have some kind of green output. There's like 50 in there. Okay. And then it's on low intermittent suction. Awesome. I checked all that. Do I have an order for that? I'm going to go check that too later. That's on my to-do list when I get to the computer. All right. Um, I have, I'll give you a tip, a very yellow looking tube coming out of his right neck. That's going all over here by his pillow. You guys see all that yellow stuff? That is one form of hemo hemodynamic monitoring. Which one is it? This is yellow. It used to be an ugly duck. Is that the is that the PAC? Perfect. Yeah, your pulmonary artery catheter or your swan gans. Same thing. So that's that's my swan gans. Okay. Do you see these white bags up here that look all blown up above him? those are the pressure bags i was talking about so for my hemodynamic monitoring um i can have up to three of these pressure bags one for my a-line one for my central venous pressure and one for my swan gans or my pulmonary artery catheter so whenever you see these swollen 
puffed up bags. They are occasionally used to slam fluids into a patient. But if you're in the ICU, if you see these bags, they have some kind of hemodynamic monitoring going on. And he's got two. So there, he's got a swan gans and they're probably watching something else on him, but I can't see. Um, how many pumps do you see? Like IV pumps, sorry. Three? Yeah, I got three IV pumps. This bag to the left, if you had to guess what it was. Normal saline. Yeah, some kind of fluid, normal saline, right? What's the glass bottle with the yellow stuff in it? It's the only drug. Albumin. Albumin. Perfect. So I know nothing about this guy because I found him on the internet. Do you guys already know more about him than you thought you would? <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, and then I would check all this stuff on his arms, obviously. Like, I had to toe is real, real in ICU. Um, this, the girl in the back with the black hair, this thing back here is the ventilator. It's one of the older ones, okay? And I can see the blue and white tubing coming over the bed railing. So that lets me know this patient is intubated, even though I can't really see her, okay? Um, do you see a pressure bag anywhere? In yes. Kind of in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So over. Oh, sorry. You can kind of see my mouse. That sucks. Sorry. Yeah. Over um, to the left of the nurse with her, her back to us, that white inflatable bag that looks like a blood pressure cuff pumpy thing. That was smart, right? Um, <laughs> so because I see that pressure bag, this patient might have some kind of hemodynamic monitoring going on. So I'm going to go look for a central line or an A line or a. Uh, swan gans, pulmonary artery catheter, right? Um, there's lots of pumps to be expected. Uh, do you see this? It looks like a bigger bag of kind of yellow stuff here. Uh, right above the pumps. Mm -hmm. What is that? It's in a huge bag and it's like yellow. Pan. So that's your TPN, your total parenteral nutrition. A lot of times these patients, ha TPN has to go through a central line. So if you see this big bag of like this just weird colored looking crap, it's probably TPN. <laughs> okay. So good. I know this patient's getting some kind of feeding. Um, any guess of anything on the ground? I got a yeah, Foley all the way to the right. Tube. Beautiful. Chest tube drain, yeah. The chest tube is right next to the nurse. And then the Foley is all the way to the right. The other two weird little ones on the bottom, if you haven't seen those before, and it depends on the hospital, but I think those are wound vex, meaning that this patient had probably some kind of surgery, right? Something very common you're going to see is this thing in the middle with um, that hose reminds me of like a dryer hookup hose, if you haven't seen that before. Any idea what that's for or what it's called? Okay. So that thing's called a bear hugger. So again, your patients in ICU can't thermoregulate a lot of times. A lot of times they're too hot or too cold. So from looking at the bed, do you think this patient was too hot or too cold? Cold. Probably too cold. She's buried in blankets. Okay. So I don't think this patient has a fever. Okay. That's one thing. The bear hugger is a, almost like a paper blanket that you connect to this white hose and it runs hot air through it to warm up your patient. Um, bear hugger is a brand, but typically that's what everybody calls it. So you have a bear hugger to warm your patient up. It's B-A-I-R, bear hugger. Or you have a cooling blanket, which would be another machine. So as long as you pay attention to everything that's in that room and whether or not it's actually connected to your patient, you're going to get a lot more than you probably thought you could. Um, last thing, this top right corner up here above the monitor, do you know what kind of pump that is? Isn't it a kangaroo pump? That's a kangaroo pump, yeah. Really? So I would just be like, hey, is this connected to anything? Like, it might just be in the room. That's the other thing. It's all because you see it in the room. Like, you want to see where it's running, right? That might just be in the room or she might be getting food that way, too. And this is our last one, all right? Um, look at your monitor. What kind of hemodynamic monitoring does this patient have? Arterial. There is an A line somewhere because there's red lines, like a red waveform and a blood pressure up there. So this patient has an A line somewhere. Um, what's that monitor to the right, the big one next to the person? 
Is that hemodialysis? Yep, that's dialysis. All right. Um, do you see this brown bag over this medication? What's that for? Is that some type of light sensitive? Med. Yeah, you're, there's a handful of light sensitive meds. Levofed is a really common one that you're going to see in the ICU. Um, so that's a light sensitive medication. Um, what pump is this one right here? Above the IV pumps. Kangaroo again. Okay. Do you see it any food hanging? Any like tube feeding hanging? No. That's what that purple bag back there is. There's like a big creamy looking purple bag. That's yeah, it's kind of hidden. I know. I it was really hard to find pictures like this. Um, and then what position is this patient in? This one's kind of crazy. This is a whole COVID. Thing. Prone. This patient's prone. prone. They're face down on a ventilator. Actually, are they on a bed? Yeah, you can see the. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Right okay. Okay. The blue and the white too. Blue. Yeah. So. Okay, that was it. That was a lot. Ooh. Any questions? Lighting is terrible. Thank you. You're welcome. My boyfriend was telling you to say thank you. Uh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> You're now an ICU nurse. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, I'm willing to discuss anything further. I can talk about Zering the Line further if you want to stay on. I can also go into psych stuff, some kind of like basics on psych if you guys want. Um, so I'm free for it if you're free, but I don't want to keep anybody either because I already ran over. Put it in the recording and then oh, I will end the recording of the video.